Amen, buddy. Come and, come and bless us. Man. Anything. Thank you, buddy. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to come. So let me ask you this. What would you like to get out of today? We're talking about emotional health and leadership, but what would you like to get out of today for yourself? Anything? Now, this is, this, is, this is a great question, Victor. This is, uh, this is very important. Most leadership programs are really designed to get you to get other people to do stuff. But they don't make you look at, the, at, the, they don't make you look at who you are as a leader. And this is, this is making you look at who you are there because leadership comes out of who you are at the emotional level as well. And, and, and um, the country is a very unhealthy country emotionally. Uh, if, you're, if you like reading about culture, two books I always strongly suggest people read. First is called The Death of the Grown-Up by Diana West. The subtitle of her book is How the West's Arrested Development is Bringing Down Western Civilization. That America is emotionally an adolescent nation at the emotional level. Look at how people deal with conflict. Look at the broken family. And where there's... Um, and so... Um, we'll talk more about that, which is why I got into this many, many years ago, into emotional health. Um, and so the second book is by now a senator from Nebraska, Ben Sass. His book is called The Vanishing American Adult. And uh, that is a sobering look at where we're headed as a nation. Where Diana's work is um, it's a little more detailed in how we got to where we are, and then how that plays out in foreign policy, how it plays out and domestic policy, those kind of things. And another book is Alienated America by Tim Carney, a Catholic Christian, brother in the Lord. And he's uh, one of the uh, senior staff people at the American Enterprise Institute. And um, so I do a lot of reading, so I read about three to four books a month. So please, it's not that I'm smart, I just like reading and learning, all right? So anyways, but this is really a look at who you are what you bring to the table. Um, Tom Clancy, if you know that name, uh, the Jack Ryan series. Uh, Tom Clancy is a very famous author and uh, thriller and military things, but he wrote three nonfiction books. The three nonfiction books are biographies with retired uh, military generals. One of those was Lieutenant General Anthony Zini. I saved the book because of one paragraph in the last chapter. In, the, in these three books that are about the history of these guys' lives, Zini was a Vietnam vet, young Marine. He was head of Central Command uh, for um, the military and all of, during the Somalia stuff, those kind of things. He retired, and Zini said this, um, retired 30-something years, uh, three-star general. He said this, the United States Marine Corps trained me to be a great leader. He said, I've gone to hundreds of leadership training programs. He said, but every leadership program failed to teach me the fundamental of good leaders. Not one of them ever said this. You have to love the people you lead. He said, not one ever said that. All of it was about getting your people to do stuff. And what you're going to learn today is, if you teach an adult who is really an emotional child, leadership principles, all you did is weaponize an emotional child to use the leadership principles you just taught against their, their, the people they lead. With the brokenness of this country, we need mature leaders. But love requires maturity, particularly the love that Jesus talks about. To love like that requires emotional maturity. But we are an immature nation. And I'll tell you my story in just a minute, how I got there. Someone else, what would you like to get out of today? How to deal with your emotions. Yes, we as adults sometimes just let our emotions go all over the place. That is beyond what I do in here. We'll talk a little bit about it, but I did bring my curriculum back there called Relate Well, mm -hmm. which actually is all about that. It is, it is how you deal with conflict in healthy, mature ways, even if you're not a mature person. All right? Uh, I raised my kids on those principles way back when because mm -hmm. I wanted my kids to be mature adults when they became adults. And so the Relate Well curriculum is actually designed where I teach people how to be angry and sin not. I teach you how to be slow to anger, quick to hear, and slow to speak. All that's about brain regulation. Anyone else? I, I don't know if, uh, I, I've been to a couple of your sessions. I don't know if you said it or I read it somewhere or whatever, but uh, the, the 
If it's great, then I said. If it's not, then it's somebody else. <laughs> Yeah. So this is who you are. And then once that happens, then just like you said, things begin to uh, fall into place a little bit easier. Um, you can love the people that you're working with, and uh, whether it's counseling, coaching, or, or, or pastoring, yeah. or whatever, and it changes a lot of things. Um, and obviously it starts here, and it doesn't start out there. We just, right. we, where we begin is out there. So, okay. so I'm, I'm more interested in the, the, the who you are, We'll cover a little bit of that today. Yeah. Anyone else? I could use help being a good husband and father. So, uh, this is why I got into corporate work. Well, we're, we're, uh, we're going through some stuff in the Robertson household that uh, I think there's some conflict going on there. And we'll be, I'm just not sure how to handle it. We'll be covering a little bit about why we do what we do around core biological relation needs that got hardwired into the brain. Uh, I, use, I use the acronym CARES around that. We'll talk about that. It, it's a thousand foot view, but um, it'll give you a sense. Anyone else? All right, then. If not, this is me and my family. I was born to Richard and Barbara. First five years, I was born in Miami. They divorced after five years. Um, my father got custody of all four of the kids back in the 70s. Well, back in the 60s when parents divorced, uh, mama got them always. But in this case, um, my dad got custody. He's having an affair with a woman that became my stepmother. I didn't realize they were having an affair until many years later as an adult. My father had an anger problem that he had from his father. And uh, I was around 10 or 11. My dad bought a cap rod used to shock us. And so I didn't grow up in a healthy home. There were addictions and craziness. And um, my little brother got the worst of the violence by my dad. Um, a reason I have a PhD, two master's degrees, a BA, LPC, clinical member of the AA, MFT, CIA, UFO, EIAO, is because I'm an overachiever, not because I'm smart. I learned jump hurdles. My father's been dead almost 36 years. Um, he died at age 47. When my father died at age 47, about 36 years ago, uh, emotionally, he was, still a he was still a teenager. He was an emotional adolescent. And my father could not raise his children to be healthy, mature adults because you can't raise your children to be something that you're not. You only raise them to be what you are. Because you cannot give somebody something if you don't possess it. And so I was pretty broken and wounded. I was not raised as a Christian. Uh, my, my father's side of the family is Jewish. My mother's side, historically, are Lebanese Muslims. I was baptized Catholic, raised Unitarian, and got saved when I was uh, 17, right out of high school, a small Baptist church in Mableton, Georgia. But I've learned something. If you're dysfunctional when you get saved, guess what? You're dysfunctional after you get saved. Or I'd say this way, that Christianity is not immunity from your humanity. Whatever baggage you had before, you're still going to have until you decide that you're going to change. And God does not change anybody who does not want to change. Did you get that? God does not change anybody who does not want to change. He will not impose his will on you. He'll let you choose to spend eternity in hell before he makes you love him. That's how much he won't control you. Sadly, immature people like to manipulate, control, wine, sulk, manipulate people to do what they want. All that's manipulation. It's about your woundedness, your brokenness. So I left home, joined the United States Navy. I'm a proud 12-year Navy vet. Got stationed in Jacksonville, Florida, where I met that lady, Luella, who's also from an alcoholic and broken home. So two broken people found each other. I really didn't know what love was because I'd never seen it, never experienced it. But I knew I loved her, but I didn't know what love was. And we got married in 1984. I was still on active duty. And divorce was never going to be an option for me, ever. I was not going to replicate a generational curse of divorce and addictions and craziness. It, neither did Luella. Gorilla grew up at First Baptist Church of Jacksonville. Uh, that was her safe haven from an alcoholic crazy home. Um, I wasn't raised in the church, and so 
Um, people ask me, are you ordained? I go, yes. They go, what's your ordination? I said, Southern Baptist. I go, oh, you're Southern Baptist. No, I'm Navy Protestant. That's what I tell people. I'm Navy Protestant. What does that mean? In the military, um, the way it works is you're either Catholic, Jewish, or Protestant. You see, in the military, all I say is, it's Raquel, right? Mm-hmm. I would, are you, do you know Jesus, your Savior? And she'd say, yes. I go, we're friends. You say, well, I speak in tongues. I don't care. Well, I mean predestination. I don't care. I don't believe in predestination. I don't care. You want to know why? Denomination is just another word for division. That's all it is. And what divides us? Issues have no bearing on eternity. And where there's division, you will find Satan. So I told my kids, it really doesn't matter what people believe theologically, doctrinally. Now, if someone says Jesus is not the Savior, hill to die on. Someone says it's not a resurrection, hill to die on. But all this other stuff, leave it alone. God values unity and he values relationship more than these other little issues have no bearing on eternity. So that's who I am, which is also why I serve in so many different denominational churches, because I don't get caught up in those issues. I don't really care, because I just go to the fundamentals of our faith. But outside of that, if you believe predestination, then you ain't got choices. You have free will, you got choices. I don't really care. Make sense? I'd rather have relationship, because it's in unity we can do far more. But I grew up in a home that was divided, and so did Luella. And I could take that same division in my marriage, in my home, or I can live in what? Unity. But to live in unity requires maturity. And I wasn't mature. I emotionally was a child when I got married. Didn't know that I didn't know that, but I was. And so, Luella and I had a lot of growing up to do. And uh, we were committed to making sure we would not pass on that generation sin curse. And so today, at almost 36 years of marriage, we are a strong marriage. We are very strong. Uh, is it perfect? No. Is it mature? Yes. Am I mature? Yes. You think, oh, that kind of arrogant. No, actually, it's not. Because six weeks ago, I was driving somewhere, and Luella calls me. It was like 7.15 in the morning. I was going to a breakfast meeting with one of my leaders. And she called me, and she said, you got a minute? I said, yep, just driving. To go meet Josh. And she said, um, your goal in life is to become a mature adult. And I said, yes. And you've always wanted to love people maturely. I said, you're right. And you wanted to love me maturely. She said, yes. I said, yes. She said, well, I've been studying this week through 1 Corinthians 13. And I want you to know you are that man. And I just teared up. <clears throat> I said, thank you. Because I've, I've fought hard to become that man. And if my wife says I am, then I must be. Right? <laughs> so I got evidence of it. Now, the first 10 years of marriage, I wasn't. I was an emotional child, still trying to get his needs met in unhealthy ways. The problem is, you're also going to lead out of who you are emotionally. Did you get that? You're going to lead out of who you are emotionally as well, whether you like it or not. And most leadership teaches you principles. Now, I'm not against principles, but you can go to any type of leadership program, John Maxwell, whatever. The problem I have with that is I've seen a lot of immature adults go to those things, and they come back and use those principles against people. Look, folks, the core of leadership is about who you are as an individual. And so this today is really a kind of a look in the mirror and what I had to do with my own life. That make sense? So we raised those kids right there. Current ages are 31, 29, 27. He's living in Berlin right now. His second year of his master's degree in, uh, at Columbia University. Um, he'll graduate with a master's in public policy and administration focused in China. He's engaged to a young Egyptian girl he met when he lived in Indonesia for four years. And the, we're, December 8th is the meeting with the U.S., the, uh, the, the embassy in Cairo for a fiancé visa. We're hoping to get it done finally after a year. So he's pretty healthy, mature, not perfect by any stretch of me, but a pretty healthy, mature young man. My daughter, Madison, graduated Georgetown University with a master's in Arabic studies. Uh, she lives in Dubai and has been over there for quite a few years. She's traveled all over, all over the Middle East um, and Europe. She's uh, fluent in Arabic, speaks some French. And then my youngest one here is currently at Xinhua University in Berlin. Um, he just graduated from Cambridge. Now he's working on a master's in global affairs there, which is Xinhua is China's Harvard. And he's working on a master's degree there in global affairs. He's already written 40 articles on the Syrian refugee and resettlement issues. Uh, he's already considered an up-and-coming world expert on the Syrian refugee crisis. 
those kind of things. So he's done pretty well for himself at age 27. He speaks fluently uh, Mandarin and uh, Arabic as well. And so I say all that to say this. We raise the kids on the principles that I teach that are back there in that curriculum back there. I raised my kids on those because I wanted to raise my kids that when they became adults, they were adults at the emotional level. They weren't like mom and dad. All right. So I had to become it before I could be it. Make sense? All right. So anyways, with that, we're going to prepare our brain. Some of you, if you've seen me talk before, you've seen this. But others not, but this is important for me to go through again. This circle represents all the knowledge that exists in the world. If this represents all the knowledge that exists in the world, how much knowledge of this knowledge do you think you actually possess? Huh? I'm not even in the circle. You're not even in a circle? So really a small dot, right? Yeah. I mean, we can all admit, based on all the knowledge that exists in the world, you don't know much, do you? Right. All right. So we need to make this thing big enough so we can actually see it. Now, have you ever noticed, though, we're all admitting logically, rashly, based on all the knowledge of this world, you don't know much. But have you noticed that when you're in conflict with someone, your brain acts like it knows everything? Just be aware of that. In conflict, your brain acts like it knows everything, but you just admit you don't know much. We're going to divide this knowledge in some categories. The first category is a category of things you know. Then there's a category of the things you don't know. So in the realm of knowledge are things I know and things I don't know. And what you know and what you don't know have one thing in common. Your brain knows what it knows, and it knows what it doesn't know. Someone shares me something you know that you know. Anybody? What's that? You know you know you're in Raytown, all right? Someone else? You know you know you're married, all right? Hopefully you know you know your gender, you know you know your age, you know you know your hair color, right? Some, that kind of thing. Uh, my, hair, my hair is actually jet black. I just dye it gray, all right? You didn't know that, I'm sure. All right, now... <clears throat> We have a realm of knowledge of things we know that we know, but there's a realm of knowledge of things you know you don't know. What's something you know you don't know? Quantum physics. Quantum physics. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, <laughs> all right? I don't know where that guy is. He lives everywhere, apparently. Herman, wherever he goes. All right? So you get the concept. In my realm of knowledge are things I know I know and things I know I don't know, right? Now, what you know you know you know you don't know have one thing in common. You know what you know, you know what you don't know, and what you know you know know you don't know is a dot and it isn't much. So practically, here's how it works. Luella and I are in an argument. And, and you can only argue from your realm of knowledge because your brain only knows what it knows, right? So I'm arguing from my dot. She's arguing from her dot. But in the midst of the argument, Luella says something that I, and this is the massive area outside of the dot, she says something that I didn't know that I didn't know. Now, what's something you don't know you don't know? You don't know. And if you're sitting here going, huh? It works this way. Before you ever heard my name, saw my name, or saw me, you did not know that you did not know me. Right? And the reason you did not know that you did not know me is because you had no what? Knowledge of me. The moment you gain knowledge of me, how do you gain that knowledge? In that moment, I became someone you know you don't know. After today, you may not want to know me, but that would be a different conversation. You see how it works? All right. So then, Luella and I argue back and forth, and in the midst of the argument, she says something that I didn't know that I didn't know. And when she said the thing that I didn't know I didn't know, it conflicted with what I knew that I knew. Ever been there before? And when she said the thing I didn't know I didn't know, that conflicted with what I knew that I knew, in that moment I also knew that I was wrong. Ever been there before? What do most people do in that moment? What do they do? They defend themselves. They double down. And you go, why? Even though you know you know that you're wrong based on what you didn't know you didn't know, you still defend yourself. Why? We say this way in our world. It's because you're not teachable. I raise my kids to know one thing. You always know mature people. They're teachable. Immature people are not. Scripture says that, uh, that wise men accept rebuke. Well, why do wise men accept rebuke? Because wise men know they know. There are a lot of things they don't know they don't know. Because they know they know. There are a lot of things they don't know they don't know. They choose to stay what? Teachable. But the day that you double down and act as if you know everything, you just proved yourself God or a fool. I don't think you're God, so don't prove yourself a what? A fool. Now, to stay teachable, you're going to have to move to humility. And God gives grace to who? Because humble people are teachable. Now, here's the thing about humility. Mature people, mature adults, live in humility. Immature adults move to defensiveness. When in conflict, mature adults move to compassion and cooperation which requires humility. Immature adults move to defensiveness. They go to the lower order animal brain. Fight, flight, or freeze. It's one triggered at one, two thousand seconds. Mature adults regulate that part of their brain 
and treat you with four words, which we'll get to in just a minute. Does that make sense? So since I know uh, Victor, I'll pick on him. Let's say I say to Victor, hey, Victor, did you know you have an anger problem? He would say, I don't have an anger problem. And I would say, well, how do you know? He says, because I know, because he knows what he knows. It's in his realm of knowledge. And I would say, I got that. I asked, how do you know that you don't have an anger problem? He said, because I know, Rick. I said, I got that. I asked, how do you know? He said, because I know. And I would say, well, Victor, did you know that you do this, you do this, and you do this? He said, no, I didn't know I did those things, things he doesn't know that he doesn't know. And I said, you do those things. He goes, I didn't know I did those. I said, but you do. And those things suggest you have an anger problem. What an anger problem? Well, actually, what he doesn't know that he doesn't know is he does have an anger problem. And listen to how I word this. The issue here isn't whether he does or does not. The issue here is his unwillingness or inability to consider the possibility that what he thinks he knows he knows is something he doesn't know that he doesn't know. If you learn something you didn't know you didn't know that conflicts that you know that you know and it's actually true, but you don't want to deal with it, that is another name. And that's called denial. And that's a different animal. The question is people who live in possibility can create for themselves whatever they want. People who don't consider possibility will always be who they are. Make sense? Legalism in religious circles are people who live in their dot religiously what the Pharisees were. It's what the Pharisees were. Jesus did something on the Sabbath. Hey, you, you can't do that on the Sabbath. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, we know you can't. No, you don't know that you don't know I can. Hey, you can't touch a leper. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Well, you don't know, you don't know that I can't touch a leper. And they killed him for it. Because these people only live in their dot and that their dot is all there is to know. And when people who live in a dot hear information that threatens their thinking, they either become humble and consider the what? Or they'll squash you because they don't want to deal with their insecurities. And that's mostly what happens. And it's not just religious systems of thinking. It's all kinds of think systems of thinking. You with me? My ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways and thoughts are far bigger than ours. And it's so, I mean, the only person who knows all this knowledge is God himself. All we have are little pieces of it. Make sense? So as we go through today, I may say something that you didn't know you didn't know that conflicts with what you know that you know. Only thing I ask that you do is don't write me off. Hear me out first before you write me off and consider the possibility I might be right. I just might be speaking in a realm of knowledge you don't have. Not that I'm smarter than people. I just have a different realm of knowledge I operate in. Make sense? And you have a realm of knowledge that I don't operate in. Got it? I graduated from uh, Southwestern Seminary. There are two master degrees and a PhD. All right? But my theology is not an MDiv. I have a master's in management therapy, a master's in education, and a, and a PhD in counseling psychology. I had some theology, but I don't know Hebrew and Greek. I admit that up front. Right? I don't know it. And I know that I don't, I don't want to know it. Okay? But that doesn't mean people who know Hebrew and Greek are smarter than me. They're just operating in a different realm of what? Knowledge. That's all. And I might want to learn something from them. That's how, you, that's how you learn. You never learn by talking. You learn by listening, by the way. Okay? Questions or comments about this? Well, if you know you have an anger problem, it's not toward people. It's I mean, all the people out there. But it's more toward your family, the ones you love the most. And your, your, your daughter, especially, my teenage daughter, who have the best way of pushing my buttons. How do you deal with I mean, I'm like, I try to work on not getting flying at the them whenever they lose checks, whenever they lose keys and they have to drive. It's not about them. Yeah, it's, it's not about them. It's about what it means to you. And, uh, and it's just like, you have to identify with that piece. It's still unknown to you. This will be good for you today. Yeah, it's going to be good for me. This will be really good for you today. I didn't know. Yeah. Because it, I've never seen that. Yeah, because... Not everybody else. It's just my yeah. girl. Which is a great comment. Which is a great statement. Why is it we're different in public than we are at home? People say to me, because I do corporate trainings in emotional health and leadership and businesses, and I got into it to save marriages. Because I teach these principles in the workplace, just not using Bible verses. And, and people are coming going, hey, I wasn't going to save my marriage. I was just I was telling him, I was just in Vancouver speaking for the metal treating industry, and I just did a one-day one day version of this for them four weeks earlier for their executives. And three wives at the, their national conference in Vancouver 
came up and told me I saved their marriage. Well, how did I do that? Well, you taught our emotional wealth from leadership, and my husband's have been changed ever since. You see, you can affect people out there in the workforce without using Bible verses. Just take the principles to them, and God can use it. And one guy actually told me he and his wife were going to church because they watched all my YouTube videos. He goes, you know, all your YouTube videos are religious. That's what he told me. And I said, well, I do a lot of work in the faith community. And he goes, well, after watching all those, he said, we decide we're going to church. We need to get back with God. We need to get to God. And I said, cool. And so they're trying to find a church there in the Philadelphia area where they live. But you can affect people. But here's the thing. Why is it that we, why is it that we treat people different at work than we do at home? At what? home, you're comfortable. Home, you're comfortable. You have patterns of maybe more abusive language at home than you do in public. You allow yourself more. Yeah. Why are we different? Because we know at work, if you do something too much, you're going to get what? Fired. And here's the real reason. Work relationships out here require no vulnerability. Home requires vulnerability. You can't lie about who you are at home. They know the real you. The people in public don't. That's why when I was on staff at First Baptist Jacksonville many years ago, I told my kids, if the way you see me treat people in public is not the same way I treat you and your mom on a regular basis, don't trust the faith. You know I don't believe it either. If you walked away from, the, if you walked away from Christianity, I should not complain because I didn't do it myself. The real me is the guy at home, not the guy in public. That's a fake. The real test who I am is with Lilla and you. I held myself accountable to my kids. There's credibility when I live it at home. There's a lack of credibility if I don't do it. Make sense? There's an integrity issue. Integrity issue. All right, but the answer to your question is, what is it, what is it going on, what's going on inside of you? That, what, what is it, the meaning is? And maybe we can come figure that out today, piece of it for you. But think of the vulnerability about it. Anyone else? Thoughts, comments? All right, you have this card on your desk. This is the essence of, of what I believe is important. It's actually in your handout as well. As I was transforming my life from, a, from an emotional child into a healthy, mature adult, Four words kept emerging for me. Four words. The four words are these. Goodwill. Respect. Humility. And empathy. These are the four ways in which I used to hold myself accountable to how I treated people. All right? So this goes back about 20 years. I was an immature adult. And so I needed to start treating Luella better. I needed to treat her more loving, more caringly. So I began to realize what I needed to do is, I'm about operationalizing things, by the way. There's a lot of, I don't like using a lot of Bible words because Bible words get misused in different denominations, whatever. They have different, they take on variations. But in the end, when you say you need to be more loving, what does that look like practically? Can you operationalize that word for me? And I'm about operationalizing. This, what does it look like right here, right now, in this moment? Don't tell me to be loving. What does that mean? What, what does it look like practically? So I'm highly practical in all that I do. Here's what I realized. If I was treating you with goodwill, now what is goodwill? It means whatever I'm doing to you seeks your best interest. It doesn't seek to harm you. It doesn't seek to tear you down. It doesn't seek to manipulate you. I have worked with leaders who treat people with ill will. And they expect their followers to respect them. I was doing a training for a John Deere company quite a few years ago, and uh, I was t 10 of their core leaders up in northern Wisconsin. And I was talking about this, and one of the, one of the engineers, leaders, pushes himself back from the conference table and goes, so this is all touchy-feely stuff. I said, excuse me? He goes, this is all touchy-feely stuff. That's what you're really talking about. And I'm always about goodwill and respect, because goodwill and respect equal love. So I never give people input without their permission. I've learned that a long time ago. You want to give people input into life, ask their permission. I said, I said, what are you implying? He said, you need to understand something. We're engineers in this room. And I said, okay. I said, may I give you a thought? He said, sure. I said, do you want to be an engineer with a heart or an engineer who's heartless? And the room was real quiet. And he goes, okay, I get it. I said, I'm not asking you to not be an engineer. You don't want me designing a building, guaranteed, or building a bridge. It will fall, all right? I'm not asking you to not be an engineer or not to be an accountant, but for you to use the fact that you're an engineer or an accountant to justify how you mistreat people, I disagree. People don't check their humanity at the door. 
and I'll say this, the most abusive work environment I worked in was the church. They got away with stuff you would never get away with AT&T or secular companies. It's a very abusive work environment. <clears throat> I'd ask myself, is the way that I'm treating you, is it goodwill? Is it goodwill? In other words, whatever I do seeks to build you up, doesn't seek to hurt you, harm you. Secondly, I asked myself, is the way I'm treating you, is it respectful? R respect is about honoring and valuing another. To cut someone off when they're talking is disrespectful. To control, manipulate somebody, to take, get from them what you want for yourself is disrespectful. And there's no love in this. So I began to realize, if I want to make sure that I was treating you lovingly, I'd ask myself, is the way I'm treating you is a goodwill and respectful? If I knew I was doing this, then I knew I was being what? Loving. But to do this, I also had to become that, didn't I? Humility is right assessment of oneself. Humble people, humble people know their strengths. They know their strengths. They don't go around with self-deprecation, beating themselves up all the time. That ain't a healthy person. That's an unhealthy person. Healthy people are humble because they're so secure in who they are, they don't need to control you, manipulate you. They know their strengths and they know their weaknesses. And the last word I would ask myself is, am I always sending you the message that I care? That I care, that I, that I know how it is for you, that you matter, that you're important. And if I knew that I was sending you the message that I care, which requires what? Empathy. Mourn with those that mourn and rejoice with those that rejoice. To do that verse, Romans 12, 15, requires empathy. You cannot mourn with someone if you don't empathize with them. You cannot rejoice with someone if you don't empathize with them. The, the 59 one another verses in the New Testament have nothing to do with theology. It has to do with how you treat people. It has to do with how you treat people, because in how you treat people, you build connections or you don't. Real simple. Uh, I, you'll, you'll hear this right now, and I'll probably say it again throughout. My favorite quote is Einstein's quote. This quote by him. Make things simple, no more simpler. If coming to Jesus is as faith as a child, then living life should not be that difficult. Problem is, we in the therapy field, in the counseling field, and sometimes we as ministers, we make things so complex, the person sitting there going, going, what? What are you saying? And yet Jesus just told, talked in parables. That's it. He just shared stories. And people got it. I think simple, I'm a redneck from North Georgia, so simple seems to be better for me. But I knew this. If I was becoming, if I was these four words, then I knew I was treating you in a healthy, mature way. All right? And about nine years ago, I got this graphic in my head. And it was so strong in my body, I had to, had to draw it on a piece of paper just to get it off my body. It felt strong. And I kept staring at it. And the word us was in the middle. Anybody knows my work, you've seen my work, you know about the idea that I live for the idea of us. It's not about me, it's not about little else, us. When us wins, you both win. Us loses, you both lose. What happens today in America, people do not live for us, they live for themselves. When you live for yourself, you will get what you get. When you live for us, you'll get something very different. The Trinity isn't us. And they never, ever, ever undermine the us and the Trinity. Marriage is the only relationship humans enter into the image. The image is the Trinity. So whenever, when marriage is being destroyed, why we, the reason marriage is being destroyed is simple. It's a spiritual battle. Because when you destroy marriage, you actually distort the image of God to the world. Mary Eberstadt wrote a book called How the West Really Lost God. And it's a study, historically, sociologically, of uh, the West, including Europe. And here's what she basically says. When faith declines in a nation, marriage declines. When marriage declines in a nation, faith declines. They're linked together like a double helix on a DNA strand. One affects the other. And the destruction of America, in the marriage in America, is reducing the image of God to the world. And the world looks at us and sees our broken families, sees our division, and then here we are talking about Jesus' love. And they go, what do you mean talking about Jesus' love? Y'all don't even do it your own home. Look at how y'all treat each other. All we see is division. We don't see unity, us. Make sense? And so everything I do is really centered around the idea of us. I got this many years ago when I was a professor at Regent University. And the Lord showed me, I was studying the idea of one flesh. What is a one flesh marriage? One flesh marriage. And I was reading all these definitions of it. And the definitions didn't seem to fit for me. And I'm not saying people's definitions of one flesh aren't good or bad. 
but for me, they didn't seem to be sufficient. And then I realized something. Both Paul and Jesus admit the idea of one flesh is a mystery. So if the idea of one flesh is a mystery, how do you clearly define something that is, in essence, mysterious? And so as a professor at Regent University, Christian Graduate School there in Virginia, I asked the question, only because I was trying to figure my own life out at that time. I said, well, Lord, if you can't really clearly define this thing called one flesh, how would I know if I had a one flesh relation? And that answer that I got from Spirit changed the trajectory of my life. I still live this way today, and that's how I counsel. And the answer was, easy, Rick. You'll feel it. You'll feel it. So I just use a more contemporary word for the idea of leave Cleveland become one, leave Cleveland become us. Now what is us? Us isn't me, it's not Luella. It's the relationship itself. When us wins, we both win. When us loses, you both lose. It takes two to make enough, only one to kill it. And everything you do gives the, uh, everything you do gives the you or gives us. There is no other option, whether you like it or not. You either give to you or you give to us. If the bulk of your decisions are based on what's best for you, you can do that. I'm not saying you can't, but you understand when you decide, when the bulk of your decisions are based on what's best for you, you're killing off what? You're going to kill it off. Now, how do you know when us is in the house? Simple, you feel it. When us is in the house, you feel the love, you feel the warmth, you feel the tenderness, you feel the connection, you feel the goodness. So I tell couples, you want three people in your bedroom every night. You earn us. When us is in the bedroom, you sleep well. You touch each other. You also know when us is not in the house. You feel that too. You feel the angst. You feel the tension. You feel the pain. You feel the hurt. You feel the resentment. You feel the bitterness. And every decision you make gives to you or gives to us. There is no other option. And I've learned to don't live for me, to live for us. But to live for us, guess what? You've got to have humility. Pride, resentment, selfishness, bitterness, all that will kill your essence off. But humility keeps us around. But I don't humble myself to Luella. I humble myself to us. Why? It takes two to make an us, one to kill it. So when I give to us, I'm actually giving to me. I'm actually giving to myself. And then here's what the Lord showed me. Us has the highest meaning in the marital bond. But every relationship has an us to it. The work team where you work has an us or it doesn't. Me and my children, individually and corporately, have an us or we don't. You and I will have an us or we don't. Work teams have an us. Families have every relationship has an us. Us just has the highest meaning in the marital bond because that's linked to who? The Trinity. Does that make sense? And you've probably worked on work teams and, and work environments where it's competition. There's fear and insecurities. And when those things begin to develop, you lose a sense of connection to the team. And when you lose a sense of connection to the team, you begin to live for who? Yourself. I show up to work, get what I need to do, get my paycheck, and I get out of there. And this is what research is actually showing us today, is what's happening, um, the symbiotic relationship between relationships and productivity. In other words, problematic personal relationships at home. All right, now this is in your manual. You probably see these in your handout, all right? Uh, page four. Personal problems at home affect work and it increases life stress in you. When, when problems at home increase stress in you, that over time, you get sick a lot more. You got it? You get sick a lot more. When there's a work-life conflict, it creates a negative work what? Environment, which to the company decreases productivity and profit. Businesses lose $6 billion a year due to divorce in the workplace. You as a federal taxpayer, you are paying, or we are paying, $112 billion annually to pay for the effects of divorce and unwed childbearing. Floridians pay $1.92 billion a year to pay for the effects of divorce. I want y'all being in the state. I have the data for your, I should have got the neighbor. I got it for all 50 states. And every divorce costs a community $30,000. All you gotta do is go get the number of divorces in your county just for last year. Multiply that number by 30,000. And that's how much you as county, you paid for the effects of those divorces in your county. It can be quantified financially. Very divorced, one person tends to go into poverty. Oh, okay. All right? 
Who actually makes out on divorces? Lawyers do and real, and real estate agents do. There's a divorce, somebody's buying a house. They make out. Or selling. Or selling, they make it. For every divorce, someone tends to go into poverty or is eligible. Kids from divorce home, data's clear, are highest risk for behavioral problems, mental health problems, and, uh, and school problems. They go on Medicaid. Who pays for their Medicaid, by the way? Who pays for the food stamps? Who's paying for the therapy? And they're also at the highest risk for criminal behavior. So now they're in the court system because it's a breakdown of the family. They're in the court system. You're paying for all that. You pay for it. I pay for it. The tentacles are long and reaching. But somehow we don't care. Even Mohammed, Jesus said he hates divorce. Why? Because the tentacles of divorce are generational and societal. But we don't care for whatever reason. We say we do, but our actions speak otherwise. And Mohammed the prophet in the Hadith, the Hadith are the words of Mohammed that don't have the same weight as the Quran. But in the Hadith, Muhammad tells a story. He says that at the end of the day, Satan gathers the demons on the ocean to give an accounting of their day's work. And Muhammad says, he called, uh, um, Muhammad said that Satan calls one demon up and says, what have you done today? And that one with fear approached Satan and said, uh, great Satan, I've been working on these two men in business. And today I got their anger to the point that it affected the business and the business has failed. And Satan grinned and said, you've done good work called the next up and said, what have you done today? He said, great Satan, I've been working on this brother and sister and this family, and today I got the anger to the point that it affected them, and it's affected the family. And Satan smiled and said, you've done good work. And he called the third up and said, what have you done today? And Muhammad said, with fear, that one says to Satan, great Satan, I've been working on this husband and his wife, and today I got them to divorce. And Muhammad said that Satan stared at him. And he said, come up here to me. And with fear that one approached Satan, Satan grabbed him and pulled him in and embraced him and screamed out to all the other demons. He has done the greatest work. And that's Muhammad. Why is it greater work? Because of the generational effects and the effects on society as a whole. And we now have quantified it. I can go into any business and show any corporate CEO how much money they have lost for every divorce they had that year. You can quantify it. It's on my laptop right here. Excel spreadsheet. It can be done. Chick-fil-A offers free marriage education to anybody in the corporate office. Why? Because Chick-fil-A understands. Don't wait for people to fall off the cliff. Move upstream and teach them how to have healthy relationships. If they know how to have a healthy relationship and with good relationship skills, that's those skills that they're learning for the workplace translate where? Back home. If they have a healthy marriage, then you have a healthy employee. Healthy employee, positive work environment, right? Healthy employee, greater focus at work, right? Greater focus at work, that translates into greater productivity. Greater productivity translates into profit. They're a business. They're not, fool. they're not fools. What do we do as leaders to invest in the emotional, relational health of our staff members, of our leaders in the churches, intentionally? Because society is broken and it's continuing to collapse. It's not getting better. It's actually getting worse. And I find it interesting that God is, God is using cultural icons to draw people to the cross. Kanye West... You know, here he is out there. If you watched his videos of his interviews, I'm like, it's genuine. You can see the humility in this guy. And yet people are trying to question it. Like, who are you to question it? God can save anybody. Save Ted Bundy before he was murdered in prison. If God can save his Ted Bundy. He can save a Kanye. And yet you see, these, you see this stuff going on in the culture right now. I'm like, interesting. He's using these cultural icons to draw people to him. There's a broken culture out there that's looking for something genuine and authentic. 
I'm going to submit that these kinds of people, people who live by goodwill, respect, humility, and empathy, make great leaders. But that needs to show up in conflict, not in the good days. Did you get that? That shows up in conflict, not just the good days. And so, if you ever listen to new Patrick Lencioni's work, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. You can get the book, The Five Dysfunctional Work Teams. Basically, if there is a lot of brokenness in society, then people tend to be more guarded. And if you treat people in a disrespectful way in, in the workplace as a leader, then you are telling them that they cannot trust you. And when an absence of trust shows up in an organization, that absence of trust is going to lead to a fear of what? Conflict. So now you have a false harmony going on. Oh, we like each other. No, you don't. It's a false harmony. Because if everyone's honest, they'd tell you what they really think. But they don't. Because they fear what? They fear conflict. I'm not willing to speak up and tell you how I really think. That fear of conflict then leads to a lack of what? And what? Lack of commitment. They're not committed to the organization. They're only committed to themselves. Thus, ambiguity shows up. Well, when, when is that project done? Uh, some, some, sometime, sometime soon. We're, we're working on it. Rather than saying it'll be done this and this, there's an ambiguity that takes place. That lack of commitment leads to an avoidance of accountability. Now there's low standards. We're doing the amount of work we have to do just to get by. And all of that leads to inattention to results, and people are looking out for themselves, status, and ego. If you want to read a really good book on the five dysfunctional work team, read Patrick Lencioni's book on this. It goes in detail. I'm just making related to when there's a breakdown in the work team, a sense of us, these things show up. Who is the one who ultimately helps develop the us in a team? It's the leader. It's the leader. It's who you are as a way of being that will build trust or not tr no trust. It's who you are as a way of being that makes your kids trust you or not trust you. And we're going to talk a little bit further into that. Any questions or comments about this? Yes. 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 Many years ago, Chick fil A under Bubba, I was a part of it for, for 11 years, and then they closed it down. They had an organization they called the Marriage Commission. Um, and once a year, we went to Windshape, all the organizations that are a part of the commission went there for a retreat and they trained us and those kind of things. But the reason that Chick-fil-A started a marriage initiative, because Bubba said, well, all of our Chick-fil-A's, particularly in the South, you have all these churches and the divorce rate is high everywhere. You would think with all the churches that are in these communities, the divorce rate would be dropping, but it isn't. So Chick-fil-A realized, wow, the churches aren't even affecting the divorce rate. So they started their own marriage initiative by inviting select organizations to come and be a part of it, those are the ones who are proving that they are having an effect on divorce. In other words, in 2016, 15, 16, and 17, in Jacksonville, the organization I just left, we had an initiative going on. We dropped the divorce rate 26% in two years in Jacksonville, Florida, Duval County, million population. We proved you can do it. We proved you can do it. They just stopped the funding. They didn't want to know what could happen. They tried three cities. And we were the ones that dropped the divorce rate. We partnered with churches. Fifteen Catholic churches came alongside. Only three Protestant churches came alongside. That was weird. The Catholics embraced it far greater than the Protestants did. It's just it is what it is. I don't judge it. It's just what it is. Yet, with all of that work going on, Jacksonville saw a decrease University of Virginia, Florida State University, Universal in Maryland, all independently came in to verify and validate the data to make sure it was accurate. And three independent evaluations said, yes, it actually happened. And now it's being written up in some journals that you can actually have an effect. But key to that, we believe, were the churches. Where is the best place to do this kind of work? It's the local church. It's the local church. And when, when you're intentional, you can actually affect communities. And so Chick-fil-A, 
as a corporation, seeks to affect, if you know their, their, their motto, their mission is that we sell chicken to transform communities. They don't sell chicken to make money. They sell chicken to transform communities. Thus, they do daughter date nights and mommy son things and all that. Why? All that's about community engagement. They just do chicken to make that happen. Make sense? All right. So real quickly here, I'm going to teach you about relationships because if we're going to be good leaders, we've got to understand how relationships actually form and happen. All right. Now, real quickly, um, if you want to have a relationship with anybody, a relationship with anybody, what do you think you need to have a relationship? All right. For the sake of time, I'm just going to give them to you. The first thing you have to have is communication. So think of these circles as uh, legs on a stool. First thing you have to have is communication. You cannot have a relationship with someone if you're not willing to what? You don't communicate with them. All right. But what kind of communication builds a relationship? Because not all communication builds relationship, right? If I call you names or I'm in, uh, insensitive or, or, or uh, that kind of thing, I'm not building a relationship with you. I'm telling you I don't want a relationship with you, all right? Tone and body language, people's brain reads tone, re, people's brain reads tone and body language 92%, only 8% the message. So when the Bible says speak the truth in what? How would you know if you're speaking the truth in love? Simple, tone and language, tone and body language. That's how you know. That's why I came up with a phrase for myself a long time ago. Love has a tone to it. And if you're speaking truth not in love, guess what? That has a tone to it as well. All right? So then, God did something rather interesting. What he said in order in the natural world applies to the relational world. All right? So then, real quickly, look at your finger with one eye. All right? So just go ahead and humor me. Look at your finger with one eye. And you look at your finger with one eye, be aware of everything that your brain sees with that one eye. The whole picture from left to right, top to bottom. Just be aware of everything your brain sees. Now switch to the other eye. Let it focus. Be aware of everything your brain sees with that eye. Left to right, top to bottom. You can switch it back and forth. Looks like your finger's moving. Here's a question for you. The picture your brain sees the left eye, is that the same picture with the right eye? No. no. Can the left eye then ever see what the right eye sees? No. To the day you die, left eye and right eye will never see the same picture. They're similar, but not the what? The same. Now, look at it with two eyes. If you look at your finger with two eyes, here's a question for you. Can you see your left eye or right eye? No. no. Left eye and right eye actually disappear with two eyes. But there's something else you get with two eyes you'll never have with one eye. Anybody see it? Something you get with two eyes you'll never have with one eye. No? Anybody see it? You get depth perception. You see in 3D. This is interesting. God takes in, God made the brain to do this. When the brain takes in information from the left eye and it takes in information from the right eye, the brain puts it out as a whole other picture, but allows you to see in three dimension. You lose 3D with one eye. Interesting. Left eye and right eye, when they communicate together, you have a better understanding of the world around you. Same thing with the ear. If you're deaf for one ear, you hear. If you're deaf in this ear, you can still hear. The hearings are different. But if you have two ears, you can't hear left ear or right ear. You can't hear the two. You just, you just hear. But there's something else you get with two ears you lose with one ear. If you're deaf in one ear, your brain goes, what was that? If you have both ears, your brain goes, what was that? You get direction. It's automatic. Your brain knows what direction to look at. But you lose it with one ear. I call it hearing in 3D. Got it? When left ear and right ear communicate together, you have a better understanding of the world around you. Take your pen, hold it this way. You can tell how long it is, right? You can see how long it is. Now close your eyes, keep your eyes closed. With your eyes closed, can you tell how long the ink pen is? The answer, of course, is no. Keeping your eyes closed, take the fingertip of your other finger and put it on top of the pen. All right, find that. Now, with your eyes closed, can you get a sense of how long that pen is? Turn it sideways. Move it around. Can you get a sense of how, what fa what, which way it's directed, where it's facing? The answer is yes. Okay, here we go. Left hand, when it communicates with the right hand, I have a better understanding of the world around me. Same thing in, with your feet. When left leg and left leg communicate together, you can tell if a floor is flat, but you can't tell if it's flat this way, but you can this way. <coughs> 
relationships are the same way. What happens in relationships is left eye and right eye don't communicate together. In other words, right here, think about this hand right here, just my hand. What do you see? What do you see? Palm, Palm what else? Five fingers, lifelines, buddy ring, lifelines? Life okay. People say there's multiple realities. That's actually not a true statement. There's only one reality. This is only one reality of the hand. There's not multiple realities of this hand. There's only one hand here, right? This is what you see. But that's not what I see. What I see, I see fingers, but I see fingernails, I see a ring, I see knuckles, I see some hair. I see a scar. This is what you see, this is what I see. This is your perspective of this one reality. This is my perspective of that one reality. Got it? We have one reality with two different what? Perspectives. How can I see what you see? Anybody? Turn your hand around. Problem is you can't turn reality around. Since you can't turn reality around, how can I see what you see? It means you have to communicate to me, and I have to what? Listen, and I have to what? Imagine it. Question, can you ever fully understand another person's reality? The answer is no, ever. You can empathize, but you can't fully know a person's perspective. Why? You're not them. You don't have their history. You don't have their experiences. But I can listen and imagine what it's like for you. And as I listen and imagine, I get a better understanding of your what? Perspective, which gives me a better understanding of this whole. Relationships happen, here it is, when two perspectives come together, that creates understanding. And when you have understanding, you've just created a relationship. Relationships are not about right or wrong. Right and wrong will undo a relationship. About listening to each other's what? Perspectives. <clears throat> but the reality is, I'm left eye, you're right eye. You're trying to tell me your perspective, but I don't care about your perspective. You don't care about mine. I don't want to hear what you have to say. No, I know what's right. Because my perspective is right. Yours is wrong. And I don't care about your perspective. Do we have a relationship now? We do this in the church with each other's leaders too, don't we? We basically, tell, we basically tell other people, you're wrong, I'm right. I go, how do you know? Well, because I know my perspective. You just have a perspective of reality. You don't have the whole reality. But what you're really saying is my eye and what I see is right. I go, but there's another eye over here. That other eye sees something you may not see. Well, I'm not teachable. Of course you're not. And you won't have a relationship, and you just harmed your work team. You've just harmed the work team. So what you're saying is I don't care about your perspective, but you're going to care about mine. Ooh, listen to what he just said. Listen to that question. Did, yeah, there you go. Listen to that question. You don't. You don't change people's perspective. Their perspective is just their what? Perspective. You honor it. You never dishonor another person's what? For all you know, their perspective may have a level of truth that will help the church. But you're not willing to listen to their perspective because you've already framed theirs as unhealthy. You with me? Yes. They may have perspective. Huh? Cool. I'll give you a practical example. One, one reality, dog. Dog. Luell perspective, don't want one, will never have one. Can't stand them. I think that the greatest things, I want one. But we've argued about dog for years until finally I realized about eight, nine years ago, I need to shut up and listen to her what? And I said, tell me why you don't like dog. And I listened to her what? 
And after I listened to her, what it was like growing up in a house where there's alcoholism, dogs were mistreated, crapping all over the house, messing up furniture, and she had to live this way, and she's the one that had to take care of them all, and she didn't want them. For the first time, I understood why she doesn't like a what? Dog. And when I realized that, I understood this greater reality that I had. It's like this, no wonder we're arguing about dog. And then I could make a decision, and I decided we, we shouldn't get a dog, even though I want one. Remember, a relationship is not about agreement. We still disagree about a dog. But once I got that other perspective in, I realized, wow, this reality that I'm living in, I shouldn't have a dog. I travel too much, and it would be fair of me to ask her to take care of something that I'm not around for that much. It would be disrespectful on my part to do that. So I gave up the idea of dog until she dies, and I'll get one afterwards. Does, uh, <laughs> does honoring... Um, Be an attractive woman? No. Did you all see an alien or any creature or anything? No. Everybody in the room's confused. What did you all see? And they go, uh, it, it's a woman. Um, she's a zombie. I go, she's a what? Well, she's got orange skin disheveled hair, uh, dark circles around her eyes. I go, did you see an attractive, fair-skinned woman? No. Did you see like a creature or something? No, just a zombie. Everybody's more perplexed. Then I go right over busy here. I go, what'd you all see? And they go, uh, looks like a moon. And it says species two, maybe season begins. I go, did you see a zombie at all? No. Did you see like a creature? No. Did you see a, an attractive woman? No. Did you all see a moon that says species two? No, just an attractive woman. And everybody's confused. And they're all trying to figure out, all right, Rick, what'd you do? And I go, here, I'll show you what I did. So I take the piece of paper off, stand behind the poster, and I go, all right, watch this. And I just move it. Remember those baseball cards that used to have two pictures, right? They're called Lintinol, I think the name for them but it has five pictures in it of the woman before and her transformation into the species. And of course, everybody's like, oh, cool, right? And then I asked the question, who was right? So I asked the question, who was right in that room? Everybody, Everybody was right, based on their what? And everyone would argue what they saw is what is in that poster. Because they are all right based on their what? Perspective. So that, so that when two different perspectives? Or mm. just two perspectives? Two perspectives of one reality. Okay. One reality of a hand. You have perspective, I got a perspective, right? Say dog. You have perspective of dogs, I got perspective of dogs. So different is not an operative word there. The perspectives are different because you're looking at the, you're, you're dealing with rea that, that one reality from a different what? Perspective. But what feeds into your perspective? Your history? Your feelings, your experiences in life, all of that shapes your perspective of dog, right? All of mine shape my perspective of dog, right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So the perspectives are different, but why are they different? Because of your life history. We bring with us into this a perspective. So different is not necessarily right or wrong. Never. Just different. Yeah, you don't like the word never. They're just, di oh, they're, they're differences, differences. It's like, it's like, look, what are some of the things we argue about today? Hymnals versus no hymnals. And we cause division over that. Hymns versus worship music. And we cause division over that. And I think the Lord looks up there and goes, personally, I like both of them. I just don't like Southern Gospel, I think he says. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the perspective thank you it's all about perspective and perspective is just what perspectives they're not right or wrong most of the time they're just different some people give the homeless money and some people don't and some don't because they think they might take the money and go use, do something bad with it right some people say look my job is to honor God by giving. What they do with it is between them and God. I honor God in the giving. I don't dictate what they do with it. Those are two different what? Perspectives. And both are operating out of one principle. Care. 
I care enough to not give you money because I don't want you to go out there and drink. I care enough because you're hurting, so I'm going to give it to you. And by the way, what you do with this between you and God. Both are operating out of a principle of what? Care. But we don't see it that way. They, they, they care, so they don't give, because they don't think you go waste money and use it on stuff that hurts you. They care, so they give, and what you do with it between them. Oh, two different what? Perspectives. Is one right or wrong? I go, neither. They're just what? Different. They're just different. But we make this versus this right and wrong. And when you make something right or wrong, when you make perspectives right or wrong, you won't have a what? Because we think the value is in being right. The value is not in being right. Jesus did not go around saying, if you don't agree with me, then get out of my face. If you don't agree with me, we have no what? He'll just agree to disagree with you and let you figure it out. And he'll be there for you. Because I will never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, ever leave you nor what? Because he doesn't make it about right or wrong. Because Jesus came to rebuild a broken relationship that started in Genesis 3. And he sent his biological son to die on the cross to, find, to seal the fact that we can have a relationship back with him if, if we want to. When left eye and right eye start listening to each other, then you're going to have a what? Does that mean I agree? No. I don't agree. I don't agree. There's a lot of people I don't agree with. But I won't sacrifice relationship. Romans 12, 18. If at all possible. The Bible says all things are possible, but it actually says something's not possible. So we have to undo that verse now. All things are possible through Christ. But then he says this, and Paul says this, if at all possible, means something's not possible. If at all possible, as far as it concerns you, be at peace with all men. Do you live in such a way that you're at peace with all men? Or do you live in such a way that creates a lack of peace with all men? I lived in such a way that didn't bring peace particularly at home, sometime on my work team. I didn't want to be that way. And I worked with people who didn't bring peace to their relationships in the work team because they weren't healthy, mature adults to do that. They were immature adults. Mature adults don't need power. They don't need power. They don't need to control. They have no desire to do those things. Why? Jesus did not go around pushing his power on us. He didn't. You want to know why? Because when you're powerful, you already know it. You already know it. I just so secure within myself, I'd rather choose operating humility. Because operating humility is a powerful way to live life. But it takes maturity to do that. Now, the second thing you have to have in a relationship is recognition. When you recognize others, you're saying, I value you and I appreciate you. In other words, if I, if I, so help me understand what you're saying. Well, help me understand what you're saying. Help me understand what you're saying. If I'm focusing on your what? Perspective, who am I, who am I, who am I recognizing? I'm recognizing you, yeah. right? And because I'm recognizing you because I'm trying to understand your perspective, then you feel valued by me. You feel appreciated by me. What you usually do is like, no, 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 you're wrong. No, no, you're wrong. No, no, I know, no, I know what's right. Who am I recognizing now? Me. I haven't died to self. I'm living for self. So when left eye and right eye start to communicate together, and this is, there's much more of this conversation that I'm not giving you because there's a lot of practical parts to it, but I got other things I got to cover today. But when left eye and right eye communicate together and you actually do that practice, are you saying, are you saying, are you saying, are you saying? Are you saying? Are you saying? That's the skill. Just are you saying? And I keep hearing your perspective by saying, are you saying? All right? And when I say, are you saying, I'm actually recognizing you, and you're telling me what you see, and I'm listening to your perspective by going, are you saying? Are you saying? Are you saying? Are you saying when that happened, you felt this? Yes. Are you saying when I did this, you felt that? Yes. 
You always know when, it, when you get it because the person goes, yes. The energy goes up. The energy goes up because they now feel that I, you feel that I feel what you feel. And when you feel that I feel what you feel, we just built a relationship. That's how you communicate well, all right? And the third thing you got to have is trust. Now, we define trust this way. If I was used a phrase, I trust you, and I replace the word trust with another word that would mean the same thing, I trust you, I know you. It wouldn't be, you can say, well, what about believe? Well, I can believe you, but not trust you. I can love you, not trust you. I trust you, I know you. In other words, we trust people based on the way that we what? Know them. If I know you to be late, what? I trust you to be late. If I know you to be on time, I trust you to be on time. If I know you to be caring, I trust you to be caring. If I know you to be insensitive and selfish, I trust you to be insensitive and selfish. If I know you to be someone who hyper-spiritualizes everything and negates how people think and feel, I trust you to be that way. And here's the thing. You create your way of being known. Do you get that? You create your way of being known. If you're not teachable, people trust you to not be teachable. And if they know you to not be teachable, if they know you somebody who's not teachable, they trust you to not be teachable, don't be surprised when they don't open up and talk to you or share with you, become vulnerable around you. Why? Because you're not teachable. If you come across as I don't care enough, they'll go trust you as someone who doesn't care. And they ain't going to tell you anything. And now you got the dysfunctions of a work team, and you're creating it as a leader. Now, if I communicate left eye and right eye, are you saying, so now you feel I feel what you feel? That means I recognize you. That means you feel valued and appreciated by me. How do you know me? You know me as someone who listens to you, who cares about how it is for you. You know me as someone who values you. That will probably reinforce you opening up to me and communicating, right? Now you've built a relationship with a Walmart employee. But I don't want a relationship, I don't want a relationship on a work team as a Walmart employee. I don't want a relationship with my kids. So we got to make this thing soar. And it's the, it's the uh, balloons right there. The balloons are the helium balloons, all right? Now think about helium. Helium dissipates in time, does it not? So if you want those things to keep flying, you got to keep what? Supplying helium, right? For them to soar. So think about it this way then. Let's kind of put all this together in a conversation. The three balloons are loving, caring, and sharing. What's common to all three words? I-N-G. That means they're verbs, which means they're what? Actions. So let's put all this together now in one simple sentence. If I communicate on a regular basis in a loving, caring, sharing way, where left eye listens to right eye, so that you feel that I feel what you feel. And I did that by saying, are you saying? That means I recognize you. And you feel now valued and appreciated, do you not? How do you know me? As a loving, caring, sharing person. And now he's just soared any relationship. And leaders, in my personal opinion, are to create that in the followers. But if I am not this, I cannot give it to you. Because I don't have it to give. I don't have the maturity to give that to you. And that's how you develop really healthy people. Thoughts or comments about this? Uh, I'm sorry, could you finish that sentence one more time? Loving, caring, sharing, dot, dot, dot. The last part? Yeah. Or the whole thing? Well, just, you were saying that those three words then create. Then I, know, yeah, if I communicate, action. then you know me as a what? As a loving, caring, sharing person. Okay. Right? That's how you know me. Okay. So when I communicate and interact with you on a regular basis in a loving, caring, sharing way, and I do that by doing all you're saying, so that you feel that I feel what you feel, you now feel recognized. When you feel recognized, you feel valued and appreciated. That means you trust me and know me as someone who's what? Loving, caring, and sharing. And you just soared in your relationship, even on a work team. I believe this is the kind of relationship we should be developing as Christians in the home. 
What's that? Yeah. We don't, we don't see this. We just, our, our thoughts about discipleship are different in the West than they are overseas. I think another value of, are you saying this is just one, one way we can communicate? Sometimes I don't know if it's even a numerical relationship. Are you saying, are you saying, and then when the person has, uh, feels safe enough to open up and, and try to articulate what they're, what they're trying to convey, uh, and they hear themselves say it, and you say, okay, am I hearing you say, are you saying, oh, oftentimes I also hear some freedom to, like, oh, no, maybe that's not what I'm saying. And so suddenly it, it yes. opens up a whole different dynamic for them to, to reconsider even their perspective. Yes. Yes. And again, are you saying is me just trying to hear your what? Perspective. I can be mature enough to hear your perspective and not take, take it personal. It's just your perspective. It's, it's this versus that in the poster. It's just differences. I mean, think about it with the poster. Let's say person over here heard all everybody else's perspective and that per, one person over here got up and walked to this part of the room and went, oh my goodness, there's a moon in there. Hey, 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 there is a moon in there. No, there's not. No, there's a moon. They're not. You guys are right. I can see it. Hey, there is a moon. There, no, there's not. Yeah, there is. I see it. Then goes to the middle and goes, there's a zombie in this thing. No, there's not. There is a zombie. Oh, you're being brainwashed by them. See, you don't even have your own thoughts together. No, I'm seriously. They're not wrong. And goes all the way to the side and goes, hey, there is an attractive woman in here. See, you don't even know what you believe anymore. The only wise one in the room was the one who suspended his perspective and went and looked at that reality from other people's perspectives and saw what was true. And there was the only wise one in the room. Yes, it's just a perspective they have, but they don't question it. That's why when he was asked a question, he asked the question back. He just asked the question back. It's a great way to do things. You know, it's not about me showing how brilliant I am. It's just asking you questions so I can hear you. But in hearing you, you get to hear you. You know? But at the same time, though, I get to find out where I'm wrong as well. Right. I get to find out where I have made mistakes along the way. And I came up with a phrase for myself a long time ago, and it's helped me as a leader. The way I think I come across is not the way I do come across. The way I think I'm being experienced is not the way I am being experienced. And what people do is they defend how they think they are or believe they are. But in the end, it's how you are that ultimately matters. Because people experience you very differently than you think you are being experienced. You might want to be willing to listen to how someone sees you because they may see you in a way that you don't see you. My wife saw me differently. I remember when I was a senior manager at uh, Charter Hospital, Fort Worth in, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and I was still at seminary. I was um, on the executive leadership team there and I was talking with one of the, um, the head of occupational therapy one day and she says, you know, Rick, the nurses are intimidated by you. I said, they're what? She said, they're intimidated by you. I go, why are they intimidated by me? She goes, because you walk around like you, you got it together and like you're so confident. And I started chuckling. She says, what are you chuckling for? If you knew my head, you would know how insecure I really am. I am highly insecure. She goes, well, it doesn't come across. I went, that was weird, because I never knew I did. I always thought I'd come across as insecure. But unconsciously, I was compensating for it. The way I thought I'd come across wasn't the way I did come across. Make sense? Mm-hmm. It's still pretty subjective. I mean, it doesn't mean it's, it's 
still very important and still very significant. You cannot you cannot get anywhere in, in terms of minister of the gospel unless you take whatever culture you're in seriously. But I, I think it's cultural laden. So from their perspective, even it's because in this culture, when you do this, people see you as this way. That would change if you went to another people group. It would. I remember in my in my doctoral work, my minor is in social work, and so one of my social work classes. We had to go spend a week and a half in New Mexico going to different Indian reservations. And what we were studying was how the different missionaries to the Native Americans were reaching them. And we got to Laguna Acoma Pueblo. And of course, none of the Baptist churches are allowed on the reservations, they're always off the reservation. But Laguna Acoma Pueblo had been a couple there for like 40 years. They westernized the Indians. They wear suits, they westernized them. I'm not saying it was good or bad. And by the time we got to Taos Pueblo, where Benny was, Benny is a Pueblo Indian, born and raised on that reservation. And Taos Pueblo Bap Indian Baptist Church is right outside the front gate there. He doesn't do that. He's acculturated the gospel into Pueblo culture. And they showed us the differences. Here, they're westernizing them. And Benny said, you don't have to westernize people. The gospel transcends all cultures. The Navajos were doing that. And yet, some felt like they had to Western them because that was their what? Perspective of how church has to be. It's just a European model of doing church. And then we got over here, and I'm like, it was a fascinating week for me. I learned a lot. So it taught me about perspectives, realities. Right? Now, you've heard the book by Daniel Goleman, Emotional Intelligence. Um, I personally like the word emotional wellness. All right? That's the term I like. Um, if you're emotionally well, then you're emotionally intelligent. The problem with emotional intelligence, to me, it makes me feel like you're also emotionally stupid then, right? If you're intelligent, then you could not be intelligent. But he describes emotional intelligence as the ability, the capacity, and skill to perceive, assess, and manage the emotions of oneself, of others, and of groups. Immature people do not emotionally self-regulate. All right? And that's why in our Relate Well curriculum, we actually teach an emotional regulation skill. We call it healing the heart. It allows you to get control of what's going on in the limbic brain so that it's not leaking out and affecting other people. So there are four main emotional constructs to emotional literacy, and here they are. Self-awareness, the ability to read one's emotions and recognize their impact while using gut feelings to guide decisions. Self-management involves controlling one's emotions and impulses and adapting to changing circumstances. Social awareness is next, the ability to sense, understand, and react to others' emotions while comprehending social networks. And last is the ability to inspire, influence, and others while managing conflict. And by the way, they work on a hierarchy. You cannot have self-management if you're not self-aware. Because if you're not aware of what's going on inside of you at the emotional level, you can't stop yourself from doing it because you don't have the what? Awareness of what you're doing. So if you look, on, uh, if you look at uh, uh, this right here, I think you have this in your handout there on page five or page eight. I, I put in here for you what each of these actually look like, all right? In other words, there's two forms of competencies for emotional competency, personal and social. Personal competencies include self-awareness and self-management. So what is self-awareness? It's an emotional self-awareness. You can know when you're feeling betrayed or you're feeling unhealthy. You can know it. You feel it. There's accurate self-assessment. In other words, you need to have an emotional vocabulary. Like if I were to say, well, how are, you, how are you feeling? Well, I feel hurt. Well, define hurt. I can think of 30 words right now that if you felt any of those, you would feel hurt. Make sense? Define what the emotion is, and self-confidence is a part of self-awareness. Once you have self-awareness, you can self-what? You can have self-control. What is self-management? Self Emotional self-control. You're transparent. You're adaptable. You have flexibility. You're achievement-oriented. You take initiative. You're optimistic. That is about who you are. But until you master these, you can't master that in a group. Now, if anybody's read Jim Collins' work, Good to Great, and other books of his, he talks about level five leaders. My brother Don is a level five leader at the highest level of emotional maturity. He is that man. And uh, he and I run Relate Well together, our, our for-profit company, going into the business world. Because we're going to reach the gospel, take the gospel to them through relationship, uh, uh, through this kind of work. <clears throat> Social awareness is when you walk into a group and you can read the emotional group. You can get a sense of what's happening emotionally in the room. 
you can read the room, understand what's taking place, because you can feel the group and you can sense the group. The highest form of relationship management, where you can, through who you are as a way of being, change the group. You can change the group by your influence in the group. Or my wife says of my brother, your brother's the only person I know that his very presence, when he walks into a room, he doesn't have to say where his very presence brings a peace to the room, which is true. He's that kind of man. Now, when he was 19, 20, 21, 22, if you take him off, he'd pick you up and throw you. He had a lot of anger and a lot of hurt from the violence we had. And his wife left him. And that was his wake-up call. And God put a man in his life named Don Russell. And Don Russell mentioned Don Marks become the man that he is today. And my brother's already mentored over well over 100 men himself. He and I worked together in the corporate world transforming people to what we're calling compassionate leadership models. Leading through compassion, which is to lead with compassion requires maturity. It requires maturity. Make sense? And so if you get a sense, we're talking about emotional health, it's really how do you become a healthy, mature adult so you can then regulate this? You see? People are immature when they go into a group setting, they create more conflict in the group because if you're immature you can't resolve issues in a group format because you don't have the maturity to do it because your own immaturity is going to show up and you're going to create more problems in the group does that make sense i worked at a, a um at an organization i was at a church and one of the directors had made a comment to our boss that there are some deacons who are complaining about some things. And our boss said to him, well, who is it? He said, I'm not going to tell you the person's name. He said, you're going to tell me who it is. He said, no, I'm not. But we all need to be aware that these are, this conversation is going among our deacons. He said, you're going to tell me right now who it is. He said, I'm not. And he stood up and hit his fist on He goes, you're going to tell me. You could feel the tension in the room. And this guy got so out of control, he said, everybody out of here except for you. And Mike told me later, he came up and got his face. He was, you're going to tell me or you're fired. He said, well, then I guess I'm fired. Now tell me, what age group does that? What age group does that? Mature people don't live that way. You see, people say I'm mature. I said, if you are, let me watch you in conflict. Then I'll know if you're mature. You with me? Your maturity actually shows up in conflict, not in the happy times. It shows up in the bad times. It's how you deal with conflict there. That's the real you. That's why I always said, when it comes, when it comes to who I am in public, I held myself a kid, accountable to my kids. Make sense? I held myself accountable to my kids. They knew the real me. You see, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, I was doing a training. I was asked to do a conference, a breakout session on emotionally, emotional, uh, healthy relationships in the workplace. And it was for the Florida Tax Collector Association's annual conference. So my breakout session, I had 200 in the room. And there I am talking about healthy relationships in the workplace. And um, 30 minutes into my talk, my cell phone rang. I actually picked up my cell phone and answered it. It was like 2005. I turned my back on the class, and this is what they heard me say. Hello? No, no, I'm t teaching a class right now. No, no. No, I told you don't call me during the day. I don't care. Fine, whatever. Don't call me again, though. All right, bye. Yeah, I'll see you tonight. This is pre-smartphone. The flip phone, so I closed it and turned around and started teaching. I don't know how long it was, it wasn't too long, but the guy over here in the back left interrupted me. I said, Excuse me, Dr. Marks. I said, Yes. He goes, Was that your wife on the phone? I said, Yes, it is. Why? What it was, why? He said, You just talked to her that way? And I answered him back this in this tone. I said, What way? Boy, you could feel the tension in the room. He said, You're here teaching us about a healthy relations workplace, and you just talked to your wife that way? I said, You don't like it? And I mean, the tension in the room was 
stick. People are nervous smiles, they're shifting in their seats. They're staring at me and looking at each other and I'm staring back at them and I said to the group, I said, do y'all feel tension in this room? And they're like, "Uh uh-huh, mm-hmm. I said, I do too. Proctor was on the front row. Her name was Nancy. I said, Nancy, would you do me a favor? She said, yes. I said, tell them what I ask you to do for me. And she stood up and she said, well, Dr. Marks asked me at 30 minutes into his lecture, call his cell phone, ring it three times, and hang up. I said, did you do that? She said, yes, and opened my flip phone and goes, that's your number? She said, yep. And I looked at the class and I said, well, I guess now you know I set you up. So now I have two short conversations for you. Number one, one action on my part, I changed every one of you. Don't tell me you can't affect another person. I turned this room from warmth into ice cold tension. Don't tell me you can't change people or affect people. I just proved it because everybody felt it in this room. And I said, here's a short other conversation. If I had continued teaching, would you have listened to me? And one lady in the middle of the room, she says, no. As a matter of fact, I was about to get up and walk out on you. I said, great. All life happens in context. So let's put a context around this. I got a PhD, two master's degrees. By some people, they're consider, I'm considered nationally known as an expert in healthy relationships. You wouldn't listen to me? And here's what she said. No, because in that moment, Dr. Marks, you had no credibility to teach me. And I go, that is all I want you to know. Everything I do from this point on has no other matter. Remember this. How often do you do that at home or at work? You don't know and you don't care. And if you keep it up, you have zero credibility. If you keep it up, you have zero credibility to teach your kids about the love of Jesus. If you keep it up, you have zero credibility to convince me that you're a pastor who really loves the Lord when you treat me that way. Because I know the real you. We'll just keep it buried in secret so you can preach. But I always told my kids, know this and know this well. God is not impressed with how well you preach. He is impressed with how well you love. Because the greatest of these is what? And love requires maturity. That kind of love. Does that make sense? Because you will be trusted based on how you're what? No. Is this resonating for you? Questions or comments? Any of that? So what you got to do, you got to quiet your own ego. You got to tell that little voice in your head, shut up. That insecure voice that says you're not good enough, you're too tall. Tell it to shut up. God's called you. He's equipped you. Live in that. You don't have to learn self-management. Reflective listening is what you need for social awareness. Are you saying, so what I hear you saying, things that therapists are trained in, or if you have taken any communication class, skills classes, active listening. And then lastly, thinking of other people rather than yourself. All right? These are the four ways in which you can get around. To quiet one's ego, you'll learn self, your self-awareness. Because when you quiet your ego, you'll move to humility. And in humility, you can go, wow, oh, I think I am angry right now. Wow, I think maybe I am coming across disrespectful. Wow, maybe I am treating you with ill will. Think of the four words. Maybe I am being prideful. When you quiet your ego, you'll move to humility, and then you'll determine whether you're having goodwill, respect, humility, and empathy, which I live by to the best of my ability in all my relationships. All right? Now, we're going to talk a bit more about humility. There is a book I encourage you to get and read. It's, it's, a, it's a leadership book. It's called Humility, the New Smart. All right. This is not in your handout, by the way. All right. If you want to take pictures, of it, feel free. But I'm telling you about the book, because what they're sh- what these leaders are showing is to be successful in the workplace in the future. Humility is your path. Robots are replacing humans, are they not? Machines are replacing us. The old smart was I knew more than you. And because I knew more than you, I have more power than you. It's not true anymore. So, a mindset about oneself that is open-minded, self-accurate, and not all about me, and that enables one to embrace the world as it is in the pursuit of human excellence. Here's what they say. 
the authors. Healthy leaders are humble and have a mindset that result in actually not being so self-centered, ego-defensive, self-enhancing, self-promotional, and closed-minded, all of which the science of learning and cognition shows inhibit excellence at the highest order of thinking and emotionally engaging with others. You see, humility is a new path, all right? So with that said, let's take a look at old smart versus new smart. Did you get that picture? Go ahead. I'm going to make sure you got it. All right. If you want to take, here we go. Old smart is I'm right and you're wrong. New smart, it's okay to not know. My knowledge is limited. You, humble people recognize I don't know. And it's okay to say I don't know. When I was in the military, if, if, you, did, if you didn't, if you just thought you knew something or if you didn't know something, you acted like you did, you got in trouble. They're like, just say you don't know. And then go learn. That's why the phrase in the military was, I don't know, sir, but I'll go find out and bring, it, bring the information back. Be teachable. Go learn. Find out. Old smart, I speak and you listen. New smart, I get input. I'm teachable. Old smart, closed-minded. I'm right, you're wrong. New smart, open-minded. I listen and learn because I don't know everything. Old smart, my worth is tied to my knowing and being what? Right because then I can feel better about myself. New smart, my worth is secure, so I can consider other perspectives and different beliefs, and I'm open to change. These are great leaders, and they teach people to be the same way. Old smart, I can't be wrong. Mistakes are bad. New smart, I realize mistakes are opportunities to what? To learn. So what? We messed up. Figure out what you got to do. <clears throat> Have you ever heard the, uh, the old corporate term, people rise to their level of what? Incompetence. That's actually not true. I like the way the SEALs say it. SEALs will tell you people do not rise to the level of competence. They fall to their level of training. You fall to your level of training, your ability. Not that you rose to your incompetence. You fell to your ability. I think that's true emotionally. When conflict comes, you will fall to your mature state. It shows up then. This is why SEALs constantly train, train, train. Every time they do a mission, they rip the mission apart. They study the mission. They look at all the mistakes they did, and they learn from it. Why? Because as long as they're training and excelling, they, their fall is pretty, pretty low, right? They don't fall much. Old smart, perfection. Mistakes mean I am faulty, thus they are intolerable. New start. I'm teachable and learning. All right? So in a sense then, in a sense then, we have these different parts of ourselves. We have our physical part, which is how you live. Mind, body, awareness, energy management, peak performance lifestyle. We all know that the that better you feel physically, right? What does it do to you emotionally, spiritually, right? It, 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 you, you, you excel. The emotional is how you feel. Self-awareness, positive emotions, resiliency how you're able to spring back from traumas and hurts. Vocational has to do with how you perform. Meaningful calling, personal mastery, your drive to succeed. Social is how you interact with people. Are you authentic? Mutually rewarding relationships, nourishing communities. Is, your, is, is the team in the church you're building, is it a nourishing community? Don't ask your community, by the way. Ask the people who engage you. Because they know who you are. They have perspective, right? They've got a perspective of you. Intellectual, how you think, deep curiosity, adaptive mindset, paradoxical thinking, and spiritual, how you see the world. Do you have a higher purpose? Is there a sense of global connectedness, generosity? And of course, in our Christian worldview, that also has to do with our faith, does it not? You see? But all, the world, all humans have a spiritual side to us. We just need to go to Jesus to take that to the whole highest level of ability and spiritually. And so we have all these parts to ourselves. And all of these got to be healthy and whole and mature. And you know, we are in such a um, harsh spiritual warfare now. For that reason, a lot, or it enables a lot of immaturity. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. What has led to immaturity? in our country. You can read it from Diana West's book. Capitalism did, was a part of it. I'm willing to admit it. She's right. Capitalism led to it. Do you know that the term teenager did not exist in the American lexicon prior to 1941? We didn't use that word. 
in the early 1900s, if a 13-year-old killed somebody, he was tried as an adult. But up until the 1940s, the term teenager, we didn't use that word much. It's after that we started to use that word. We started creating a very specific area of period of time that we now call adolescents teenagers. So I'm going to ask you a question. When do you become an adult? I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> Thank you. When do you become an adult? It's an age. It's a legal definition. When is it? 18. You're legally adult at age 18, right? Now, let's think about that definition for a minute legally. Since legally you're adult when you're 18. I mean, think about it. One day you're a child. The very next day you can do all kinds of stupid stuff. Age 18, you can engage in porn. But you can't do it the day before. Got it? You can join the military and we'll train you to kill people. You can vote. Age 16, you can drive a car. Oh, by the way, you can't drink, though. Till you're what? Why can't I drink till I'm 21? I can do all this other stuff at age 18? Yes. Well, why can't I drink? Well, because you're not an adult yet. What? Well, you are an adult, but you're not adult enough to handle alcohol. But I can do all this other stuff when I'm 18. Legally. Yes. But I can't drink. No. So now I ask you, when are you an adult? Our laws don't know. Our laws don't know. Western culture is the only culture that has no right of passage out of childhood into adulthood. Cultures around the world, on this day you were a child, and on this day you became a man. There was a rite of passage. So borrowing from my Jewish heritage, I gave all my kids a bar mitzvah, my Christian version of it. As of today, you're no longer a teenager. As of to, excuse me, a child. As of today, you become a young man. The word teenager is no longer, is not allowed in this house, only in the concept of that you've been alive 13 years, 14 years, 15 years. The word teenager has to do with how long you've been alive. I don't go around calling myself a 58-ager. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for you to go around calling yourself a teenager. Teenager has to do with how long your brain's been going on for you. You're now a young man. You're 13 years old. Your brain's been alive 13 years. That means your brain will do what a 13-year-old brain does. I cannot expect a 13-year-old brain to act like a 25-year-old brain. It's impossible. It's not 25 yet. But I don't want your brain to act like a 10-year-old because we already did that year once before. And I always told my kids, today you're now a young man, you're a young woman. Here are the responsibilities for manhood, and here are the privileges of it as well. And that's how I raised my kids, because I wanted them to know you now entered into adulthood on this day. And you're now growing as a man. You're growing as a woman. That speaks to the emotional brain. Does that help? But with the breakdown of family, that creates pain, and pain creates aloneness, disconnection. Hyper in research shows America values hyper individuals, don't we? That's why you hear things hyper individualism is crept into the church. That's why we say things like, "Well, you just need to trust Jesus." What? You need to pray about it. Oh well, can you bear a burden with her at least? Can you mourn with her at least? Can you comfort her at least? Can you do any of the one another? No, she just needs to trust Jesus. That's hyper individualism. What we're really telling you is you need to live life alone. And the Bible said it's not good that man should be. And you can be married and alone, folks. If you're honest about it. That aloneness in Scripture has nothing to do with marriage. Because you can be married and alone. If, if that verse has to do with aloneness, then we have to logically admit that singles will never be fully complete. And yet there are single people who do not live life alone. But hyper-individualism creates aloneness. Aloneness creates disconnection from relationship. And what research is clear about the more individualistic you are, the more immature you will become. Because maturity only happens in relationship. People speaking into you, getting input. People saying to you, hey, I think you need to look at that part of you, Rick. God put two men in my life to get me where I am because I didn't have a dad or a parent that could do that. So God put two men to mentor me. You, you mature through relationship, not by yourself. 
Does that make sense? All humans have to bond, and all humans will bond to something. And so in Genesis 2.18, when God said it's not good that man should be what? I'm arguing he's not talking about, he's not talking about marriage there. It's not good that man should be alone. Well, if, we, if you're honest about it, technically Adam wasn't alone. He was in the garden, in paradise, in perfection, and who is he with? He walks with God every day in the cool of the day. So if you're in paradise, no roaches, no taxes, no pain, perfect love, 70 degree weather, Ford F-150, extended cab pickup truck, and that's paradise. Blue Ridge Mountains, my log cabin home. You have all that stuff, and you're with God in it. And then God says, hey, it's not good that you should be what? But Adam wasn't alone. Who was he with? So it begs the question, how can you be in paradise with God and alone? There is a teaching in this side of the fall that says you need to get to a point in your Christian walk where all you need is God. And I said, really? Well, if that's true theologically, then why wasn't it true for Adam before the fall when all he had was God and God said it wasn't good? So if it will be good for us on this side of the fall, then why wasn't it true for Adam before the fall? Because God did not make, did not make us to need him only. He intentionally made us to need him and others. Think great commandment. But this is pre-Eve. Now Adam knows it's not good to be alone. So what happens? God gives him an assignment. Name the animals. And Adam's going through the process of naming the animals. He comes to a realization awareness. There's not another one what? Like him. What do you think he feels the moment he realizes there's not another one like him? Alone. Now he knows exactly what God means. By the way, you ever felt alone before? Read Carney's book on alienated America. We are the most disconnected we've ever been in American history. Last fall came out through uh, uh, Cygnus Research, Harvard, and others. The leading health crisis in America is aloneness. So much so that uh, Tivity Health out of Nashville has been contracted by insurance companies to solve the aloneness problem. Why? Because aloneness increases heart disease, strokes, heart attacks. It increases irritable bowel syndrome, ulcers, because it creates anxiety and stress, and, the, and, and that energy is held here. It increases psychiatric disorders, such as addiction uh, um, and depression. Depression does not create loneliness. Loneliness actually creates depression. It's actually the other way around. Dr. Cassiopo's work in his book on, on loneliness, that kind of thing. We are medicating people's brain who are not depressed. They are alone. But the mental health field doesn't allow for connection. The example I'm talking about. The Diagnostic Statistical Manual, we're in the fifth edition of it, all right? In DSM-3, uh, if you were clinical, you had all these symptoms for depression. The problem was, research was showing, well, people who are grieving have the same symptoms as people who are supposedly depressed. So in DSM-3, 3R, the APA said, okay, 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 we get it, we get it. So then... If you meet all these criteria, you're depressed unless you've had a death, then you're actually grieving. So it's called the ex grief exclusion. So if you can show grief, then we don't diagnose your depression. You're just grieving. The problem was, because of the grief exclusion, others are going like, well, couldn't there be other exclusions as well? Like trauma and those kinds of things? No, 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 no. Well, in DSM-5, the grief exclusion is gone. So now, if you have these symptoms, you're depressed, we give you a pill. That is the way it works. There is no exclusion. But no one goes, why did you get this way? What happened in your life? Trauma keeps people from relationship. And when you've been traumatized, abused, hurt, you don't go into relationships, so you live life alone. That aloneness is going to create depression. Not because your brain's not working, it's because the depression is around something that's happened to you. So we'd rather medicate you than come alongside and bear the burden with you, to comfort you, to do the 59 one and others. So you don't want, so you're not walking life what? Alone. We're more disconnected than ever. All right? Now, because of that, all humans have to bond. Biologically, all humans have to bond. Brain research proves this like crazy. All right? So then, you'll see this list in your handout 
All right? There on page 10. All humans are created by God needy. We have physical needs, we have, we have emotional needs, we have intellectual needs, we have spiritual needs. All needs must be met and all needs will be met. And, and needs have to be met. When needs are met, you thrive. When needs are not met, you don't thrive. It's just real simple. It's not rocket science. Make things simple, not, no more simpler. It's the way God designed it. So since all needs have to be met, and if you meet a person's need, they feel loved. If you don't meet a person's needs, they feel unloved. It's real simple. All right. So let's think about needs as it relates to um, physical needs first. All right. So let's say that um, uh, that uh, Victor hasn't eaten in five days. That would be a biological need for appetite. If the need for appetite is not is not um, met, he's going to be in pain. So if you're taking notes, write this phrase down. The brain is wired to avoid pain and pursue pleasure. The brain avoids pain, pursues pleasure. Just think of it. Pain pursues pleasure. Whenever you're experiencing any form of pain, the brain will do whatever it takes to get out of that pain and move to pleasure. If you have a headache, what do you do? You take something. Why? Pain pursues pleasure. The brain is wired that way. The brain was created in the garden. Sin came in, created pain. The brain doesn't like pain. It wants pleasure. All right? So just remember, pain pursues pleasure. So if he hasn't eaten in five days, he's going to have hunger pain. All pain produces symptoms, so he'll have the, the symptoms of hunger. Cramping, dehydration. What the brain is doing is sending a signal throughout the body saying, hey, the need for appetite is not met. We've got to have something to eat. So if we give him a bunch of hamburgers in order to satisfy the unmet need for appetite, the question is, would it work? Would hamburgers satisfy an unmet need for appetite? The answer is yes. Thousand foot view is basically this. The moment he takes the first bite into a hamburger, literally the first bite, the brain goes, ah. Oh, you're eating something, and the brain releases a neurochemical called dopamine. Remember dopamine. Dopamine, when released, is a, is a mood shift in the pleasure. It's like his brain goes, ha, 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 ha. He finishes all the hamburgers. He's no longer hungry. He moved out of pain into what? Pleasure. pleasure. It'll work. Well, let's say that I don't give him, what's that? Jack Stack. Jack Stack, <laughs> yeah, burnt ends. You ain't kidding. We should go back there for lunch. All right. But let's say he hasn't eaten in five days, and instead of hamburgers, I give him four boxes of rat poison to satisfy the unmet need for appetite. Would rat poison satisfy an unmet need for appetite? Think it through. Would it do it? It will. The moment he takes the first bite in the rat poison, assuming he likes the taste, of course, the first bite, the brain goes, ah, you're eating something, and the brain releases dopamine. He has a mood shift in the pleasure, finishes all the rat poison. He's no longer hungry. He moved out of pain into pleasure. Both rat poison and hammers will satisfy an unmet need for appetite. The problem, though, is with the rat poison. Because though it will satisfy the unmet need for appetite, the rat poison is also going to create more what? Pain. What does pain do? What does pain do? Perceives pleasure. So he goes back to his source of pleasure. It needs more rat poison. You go, why? Simple. Because bad love is better than negative attention. Still better than what? No attention. People are turning to rat poison ways to satisfy these needs that are hardwired into your brain at conception and will be with you to the day you die. And just like food, air, water, and shelter, they must be met as well. They're all in scripture, by the way. I just don't have them listed on this handout for you. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says, The God of comfort, the Father of mercy, who comforts me in my trials, so I can comfort you in your trials. All of these are mentioned in scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says we're to encourage one another. Galatians 6, 2 says we're to bear one another's burden. That's about the need for supporting others. All right? They're all mentioned in scripture. They're the 59 one another verses. The 59 one of the verses have nothing to do with theology. They have to do with you not living life what? Alone. Living life alone. Great leaders make sure their team is connected so they don't feel alone on that team. They feel like they're a part of a greater whole. And when you feel like you're a part of a greater whole, guess what? You can accomplish anything. United States Marine Corps, United States military. First thing they told us when we got to Navy basic training, the only color skin in this room is blue. Everybody in here is blue. We don't care where you come from, what your background is. For this day forward, everybody's blue. 
And yeah, yeah, military will be green, or other branches. And we learned that whatever we do individually affects the what? The whole. And one decision on my part can sink a ship. You don't think about you. You think about others. You think about the whole. Because all of us depend on each other for survival out there. Amen, sister. <laughs> they didn't have that language. I didn't have it back in those days. You think about the whole. You think about us. It requires maturity. But all needs must be met and will be met. Now, if I didn't get these, and by the way, if you ask me where did I get these needs met, they weren't, they weren't met at home. I had to get these needs met outside of the house. And a lot of them weren't met. No wonder I was so broken. I, and no wonder I was so smothering as well in my marriage. No wonder when I would go to work, I would, I would suck up to the leader. I was looking for approval. I was looking for acceptance. It, it was that immature little boy, though I was chronologically adult, I was a chronological with, chronologi with little boy issues. That would play itself out in the workplace. It would play itself out in the workplace. And sadly, as I began to get rank, it also played itself out as a leader. Fortunately, I had some good officers around me and, and senior enlisted who point those things out to me in a loving, caring way, you know, but they did. <coughs> All these needs must be met, and they will be met one way or another, and they're with you to the day you die. Think about it this way as a parent. What would your kids say how you were in ministering to those needs? Did they feel accepted? Did they feel approved? Did they feel respected? Because these needs are, will be with you to the day you die. Anybody know the age group with the highest suicide rate? The elderly, 60 and above. It's not teens, it's 60 year olds up. But it makes sense. Where are most of them put? They're put away in a home somewhere. So now let's put a context around it. Who comforts them? Who gives them approval? Who gives them acceptance? Where do they get attention from? In the most meaningful way. Suicide is pain pursues pleasure. The pain of disconnection is so great that you don't believe you have any value or worth because no one's there to meet your what? Relational needs. And the pain of disconnection is so great the brain figures out it'll be better to be dead than to stay alive in this pain of disconnection. So they kill themselves. It's, it's pain pursues pleasure. It's a rat poison way of dealing with life. My father-in-law shot and killed himself um, four years ago, November 15th. He was a man's man, if you can say it that way. A little Florida cracker from middle Florida. Picked up rattlesnakes, moccasins, failed marriages, lived life under his terms, and no one's going to tell him what to do, ever. He even shut my wife out for six years because didn't, she didn't vote the way he wanted her to. So he shut off the relationship with her for six years, all because of politics. And then he got sick in his 70s, and he's going to have to come live with me or his sister. And he wasn't leaving his house. He was living life under his terms and his mind. If I can't live life under my terms, then I'm dying my way. Because the pain of having to leave his house and depend on others was too great. And so he decided to kill himself so he didn't have to leave his house. And it's a rat poison way of dealing with life. But that was the way he lived his life. And he went out his way. But he damaged a lot of people along the way. A lot of people. Never knew his grandkids. Because he didn't want to know my kids. Sad, isn't it? It's just sad. These people come to church alone, and they walk out alone. We're not bonding people in the body of Christ either. Everyone must bond, and they're going to bond somewhere, even if it's to rat poison ways of doing things. The abuser. Because the abuser, 
The abuser gives them, in a weird, in a rat poison way, the abuser gives them what? Security. Make them feel like they're pretty. It gives them a place to live. If they didn't have that, where would they be? A lot of them on the streets. It's rat poison ways of getting your needs met. And when they come to this realization that you're getting your needs met in ways that destroy you. Yeah, but he loves me. No, he doesn't. But it's, a, it's her perspective. But she doesn't see the truth yet. She can't see the truth. Why? Because it's, it, think of it, pain versus pleasure. Some people will stay in dysfunction because to change it is scary. And the fear of what the, uh, the fear of the unknown is far more painful than what I know, which is screwy and painful, but at least it's comfortable. It's known, right? It's familiar. And sometimes the familiar creates security. My little brother got the worst of the violence by my dad, went on the biggest loser, lost 100 pounds, gained it all back, and lives in poverty, dysfunction. He's could have, my dad's been dead 36 years. I don't know, we haven't been shocked or beaten in a long time, but he still lives dysfunctionally until four weeks ago when he almost died. He's well over 300 pounds again, five foot four, almost died. Blood pressure went up 228 over 167. Should have died, he should have stroked. Plus his, all of his intestines were blocked. And now guess what he's doing? Changing. All of that way of living, though it was painful, was familiar. Until he almost what? Died. And the pain of that motivated him to do what? I always ask the question, why is it that people don't change? And, and there's a lot of reasons. But what I'm about to say is going to sound insensitive, but in the end, it's actually true in my mind. Every year, all the reasons are excuses. Ultimately, here's the reason people will change that. They don't care enough yet. And what I came up with is a phrase for myself a long time ago. When you care enough, you will change. When the pain threshold gets so bad, you will do something different. Some people stay in dysfunctional relationships until the pain threshold gets so bad, it's like this light bulb turns on. Donna lived in her first marriage. He was violent towards her. And it was 15 years in the marriage. He had a double barrel shotgun pointed at her face this far. And it was loaded. And she said, pull the trigger. I don't care. And she heard her say, she heard herself say that. And when that level of pain, the next day when he was at work, she snuck out, went to Hubbard House, divorced him. She started working with the abused woman in the Hubbard House there in Duval County, met Frank, recovering alcoholic who worked with abusive men, he's the Salvation Army, retired naval, naval officer, pilot, and they worked with me at First Baptist, saving marriages. God took their path, brought those two together, and Frank just died about three years ago. I did his funeral. Great man, was like a father to me. And Donna's still out there. But when the pain threshold gets too bad, you will do something different, but not until. The question is, how much pain do you have to endure? Well, actually, it's right back there on the back table. Those are the skills, how to do it. Today is to give you the, the umbrella piece. Um, matter of fact, jump over to page 14. It is possible, because you just brought up something. Let me just get there, because I know our time is kind of limited. It is possible to be a chronological adult and not a mature adult. 
So it is possible. So what we did in our work is we, we had defined what is an emotional infant, what is an emotional child, what is an emotional adolescent, and what does an emotional adult look like, all right? I personally believe if we live at the heart of the gospel, it forces you to become a mature adult, all right? It forces you there. To speak the truth and love requires maturity. To be slow to anger, quick to hear, so to speak, requires maturity. To be that way is a way of being requires maturity. And, and so let's, let's look at that real quickly here as, as we relate it to the chronological stages, all right? So chronological infants can do nothing for themselves, literally nothing. Uh, you put an infant over there, loot alone, don't meet its needs, it's going to die. So in the world of a chronological, in, in chronological infant, it is the center of the world, and everything in the world exists for its survival. So in the world of a chronological infant, because they have no verbal skills, to let you know it has a need, all you can do is scream and cry, right? And, and so in the world of a chronological infant, when it's screaming and crying, what it's really saying is, give me my breast. I want something to eat. Because everything out there belongs to me. That's normal for a chronological infant. But an adult who is an emotional infant operates the same way. Right here, you possess what I want and need and you owe it to me, even if it is love, sex, touch, intention, approval, and respect. You get nothing but exist for my needs. I am entitled to all of you, your time, energy, and focus. And I have a right to be outraged and angry when you are not there for me. My needs are constant as I never get enough of what I want, so I feel helpless. It is your responsibility to never, never let me get to helplessness. Thus, you can have no thoughts, feelings, social interaction, desires, and interests that do not center on me or pleasing me. Since I have to stay in control and in charge, I have to control you and stay in charge of you. I cannot live life without you. There's a dependency. Since I'm really dependent on you for my sense of value and worth. These adults are actually tyrants. They operate this way. I want what I want when I want it, and you're not the morning object to give me what I want. I actually worked for one of these at a psych hospital, Ray Phillips, who's my boss, who's a true narcissist. And I found a way to survive around him, you see. But you're going to find leaders who are this kind of adult. They destroy people around them. The hospital was never going to fire Ray. He brought in too much money. But he also damaged a lot of people, all right? Now, Chrono chronological children, children have verbal skills. Children can ask what they want. They don't have adult capacity to negotiate yet. All right? So a child has to move from the posture of that's my breast, I want it, to that's your breast, I want it. That's sister's bike, but I want to ride it. All right? You have something that I want. So what do children do to get what they want? All right, they act out. They whine, they sulk. Right? They threaten. I don't love you anymore. You're not my friend, Rodney. I'm not playing with you. He's just parent that. That's all it is. Now, this is what I was when I got married. It's the best my father had to raise us to be. All right? So I'm not proud uh, of, of this. Oops. So the emotional child is I have needs and wants, and you have what I need. Since it's not mine, I have to take these things from you, even if it's affection, approval, respect, love, and attention. So I have to manipulate, control, whine, sulk, punish, charm, or suck up to you to get you to give me what I want when I want it. And I will seek revenge and punish you passively or overtly if you do not give me what I want. And I have to get even with you for the pain that you cause me for not doing what I want. So I will blame, debate, run from you to get my way. And when you focus on things that are not centered on or about me, I interpret this to mean that you don't love me, that I'm not good enough for you or that you are about to reject me. So I will use negative attention to get your attention and do what I want. This is me testing you to see if I see you really love me, whether you think I'm important or if I can trust you. And this is also because I need constant reassurance and security regarding my lovability, my importance, my adequacy, and whether you want me. Imagine a leader like this. Imagine a leader like this. This is what I was when I got married, not proud of it, but it's what I was in my early 20s, the best my dad could do to raise me, all right? Now, emotional adolescent, chronological adolescents are trying to figure out two things, independence versus dependence. They're trying to figure out which of those. Mature adults learn interdependence. If you tell an adolescent to do something, their brain hears it as a threat against their independence, and you usually get things like, well, don't tell me what to do. Uh, video games are not advertised to children. They're actually advertised to adult men, young adult males. The number one reason young adult college freshmen 
are failing college, the first year college, is video games. They are not mature enough to put down a controller. They let the video get in the way of success in school, and sadly, they're also letting video get in the way of success in marriage. Why? Because they're not men yet. They're still little boys, dealing with little boy issues. So a teen, uh, an emotional adolescent, by the way, this is my dad, my need for independence and autonomy is threatened by my needing others because I'm supposed to be able to stand on my own without others. So when you suggest something to me or tell me what to do, I hear it as an attack and your desire to control me. So I will let you know I don't need you and I make sure you will not tell me what to do. I feel rebellious when you try to give me input, correct, give advice or direct me in any, any manner. I already know everything and there is nothing you can tell or teach me because I believe I'm an adult and I want the power and privilege of adulthood. I just don't want the consequences. However, all right, I must compare myself to others in every way because I have to prove myself to everyone and mostly to myself. Thus, I will not listen to you with care and compassion because I perceive your true thoughts and feelings of the criticism of me, my thoughts, my beliefs, and my behavior. So I distance myself from you. When I go away from you, when I go away from you, you can't control me. And in this space, I feel freedom, independence, and secure. And I'm unable to consider consequences and the effects of what I do since I take unnecessary and harmful risks and I find breaking rules and crossing boundaries freeing. The reason I do this is because I must prove to you and mostly to myself that I'm not dependent, though deep down inside, I do need others. I work for leaders who are these kinds of people. Don't tell me what to do. I'm the boss, you're not the boss. That's an immature person. But immature people harm others along the way. The difference is they don't care. They don't care. There are two traits that mature adults have that these three lack. And it shows up in conflict research shows. And here they are. Mature adults operate out of compassion and they operate out of co cooperation. When conflict comes, they move to cooperation and compassion. Why? Because they're humble people. So then what does a mature adult look like? Here we go. I can deal with the relationship through compassion and cooperation, even in conflict. I can listen and hear your thoughts and feelings without demanding, rebelling, manipulating, or controlling you. I have the ability to speak my truth lovingly and respectfully. And I will share these truths about our relationship, knowing that sometimes these thoughts may hurt you emotionally. In other words, faithful are the wounds of a friend. A mature adult will tell you something about you that's going to be hurtful for you to hear, but they're willing to risk the friendship. Why? Because they care about you enough to tell you the truth. All right? Immature people won't. They'll be afraid of you. All right? I just did, a, uh, I just did an intensive two weeks ago in Wisconsin. This guy is 70, his second marriage, her fourth marriage. And he calls himself a prophet. He's been kicked out of four churches because he's so emotionally and spiritually abusive. And so his current pastor, he and his wife go to different churches, he said, would you do an intense for this guy? I'm like, sure. Well, he told me up front he didn't like me. He told me I was arrogant. And I'm telling you, I have never gone through an intensive like I did. And by 10.30 on the second day, I said, we're done. We're done. He goes, what? You know everything. I don't know anything. I'm not arguing with you. We're done. It's over. Y'all free to go home. I'm done. He goes, see, there's your arrogance again. I'm like, okay, whatever. I just don't argue with the fool. Just not going to do it. He literally is, is a tyrant. And that's why he's so destructive to people. And yet he can quote the Bible like crazy. Reads the Bible all the time. Speaks in parables. Why he does that, I have no idea. You know? Because he's not this because he has to prove that he knows everything. And if you give him, I started giving him feedback. And every time I do that, his wife would go, well, you know, Rick's not wrong about that. He'd look at her and go, did I ask you? I go, don't talk to her that way, it's disrespectful. Remember my four words? We respect people. And finally, I just said to him, I said, you know, the problem here is, your people that know you won't tell you the truth about you. I'm man enough to tell you the truth about you. You don't want to hear it. And I said, you're the one that's separated. You're the one headed for divorce. I won't lose any sleep over your divorce. I'll be honest with you right now. I'm trying to help you, but you're not teachable. And that's all that matters. 
you see, some people, they just don't care, right? You try to help people, knowing it's going to hurt them. But if they move to humility, you're willing to consider the possibility that you might see something in me that I don't see. And that takes maturity, doesn't it? To consider that, I might not be the leader I thought I was, or I might be coming across a different way. Years ago when I was on staff at First Baptist, your kids will teach you things about you if you listen to them. Years ago I was doing a family conference at First Baptist, and I think it was the third night, uh, I brought my two youngest up, I think they were eight, eight and six at the time, I put them on a stool, and I said, Madison, go ahead and tell everybody, uh, how we, I didn't remember what it was now, something we did in, uh, that I thought we did in our, in our family meetings. And I gave her the microphone, I said, tell them about what we do in family meetings, about and she says, we don't do that, Daddy. I said, yes, we do. She goes, no, we don't. I said, go sit down. Oh. Jesse. And he looked at me, and he goes, we don't do that, Daddy. Madison's right. Go, go sit down. People chuckled. Well, I got home that night, and um, went up to my bedroom. Madison and Jesse sitting on my bed waiting for me. When I walked in the bedroom, Madison says, you lied to those people, Daddy. You feel it right back here in your lower brain where you get triggered. I, was, I regulated that part of it. I said, all right, I'm all ears. Tell me why you think I'm wrong. And I don't know why, but somehow I deluded myself into thinking I was doing that. And we weren't. What were you doing? I, didn't I don't even know what it was now. I just remember what happened. And now I'm going, they're right. Somehow I convinced myself we were doing that more than we really were, and we weren't. And so the next week, I went back, because I had to be a man of integrity, didn't I? I went back and confessed that to the class. Because my kids were watching me. My kids were watching me. You say you're a man of integrity, Dad? You lied to those people. Will you undo it? Will you undo the lie that you left them with? And I did. I held myself accountable to them. I can listen... I can share my hurts, fears, anger, and feelings of rejection and betrayal and goodwill with that and respect and not withdraw from you. I can also join with you in your hurts and pains and listen to you without taking your thoughts and feelings personally. And I can ask for what I want and need without manipulating, r running, smothering, and intimidating you. The reason I can do these things is because I already believe that I'm okay. I know my strengths and weaknesses. And I do not let these define my personhood. I know I am lovable and adequate and, enjoying co and enjoy cooperating with others. I understand that we are both different and that we can love, be loved, and have different interests and find fulfillment in life in different ways. Because I know I am loved by God and others and that the need to bond, attach, connect, and be intimate with others is a basic human need and not a sign of weakness. It is a confession that I am human. Joining with you in empathy and compassion, regarding your concerns, as well as considering mine and finding ways we both win, brings great pleasure and more caring relations. These people make great leaders. These people make great leaders. And that's the kind of man I've sought to become over the years. So that wherever I go and teach leadership or even lead my family or lead those that work with me, we're always building an us as a team. I build an us as a family. Because us is the highest way of living. Does that make sense? Questions or comments about this? I just had one, one thought. Yeah. In your experience, um, other than facing death or some scary future where you know, you've know completely lost control so you have no other choice but to change or die, other than that, did you find you know, a lot of wisdom literature in the Old Testament and the difference between foolish people and wise people? But in your experience, what, uh, what other regardless of their age, to the place where they are able to say, you know what, I don't want to change. I always believe it's humility and the ability to take a right assessment of oneself. Where the, you know, Paul says in, before taking the uh, communion that you might want to, what, evaluate yourself? He didn't say uh, God evaluate. He, you might want to evaluate yourself. You might want to look in the mirror before he has to look in it for, it's before you, right? I always found that there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, power in doing my self-evaluation for then for him to have me, make me evaluate myself. 
I'd rather just do that. It's a lot easier, you know. He puts opportunities in, in, in me to get a sense of who I am and what I bring into my relationship, particularly as a leader, you see. Um, now, one of the best ways I learned to do that was uh, someone had a, my, one of my mentors had a conversation with me. And here is it. How do you know what you look like? How do you know what you look like? A reflection. Not a mirror. A mirror is just a tool that gives you reflection, right? Water reflects, right? And so you know how you, what you look like by reflection. So then, I also know who I am as a person by reflection. Because how I am as a way of being in the moment is going to be reflected by her eyes, her face, her body language. In other words, who I am in the moment, she reflects. I might want to study this mirror and go, how am I coming across right now? Because maybe her eyes are looking away, maybe she's feeling, you can sense she's getting guarded. And I go, how am I coming across right now? She goes, you really want to know? I said, I really want to know. It's controlling. Remember the way I think I come across and not the way I do come across, <coughs> right? And I would say, I always told her, I, I became a student of myself. I go, what am I doing that sends that message? She goes, well, you're doing this, this, this. I say, oh, forgive me. I don't want to do that. If that's the message I'm sending you right now, I'm going to stop that message right here. Forgive me. I don't want to come across that way. And I'll shift myself in that moment. So how about like, I don't know, the fry too much. Uh-huh. Um, I have a different way of, of addressing it. Um, we'll wrap up our day this. By the way, in, in the back of your manual are some practical things for self-awareness and self-management. Also, in the back of your manual, uh, I have Dr. Ferguson's CARES assessment tool. That If you take that assessment tool and then you, um, it's on a Likert scale, minus two to plus two. And on page 26, you see the scoring sheet. So you'll see the 10 uh, relational needs listed there. Under the word comfort are, are five numbers. Those are the items in the test that relate to the comfort. So if you scored a minus two for question 10, just transfer it over here. Total is up. The top three needs, Ferguson calls priority needs. Those are the three biological relational needs where you feel most loved. It's also where you feel most unloved. So your brain is going to be very hypersensitive around those three areas. Just so you know, it's not, I'm not here to bash it. I'm not a love language guy. Mainly because the love languages are metaphors. They're metaphors. I go to biology. In other words, if your love language is physical touch, you have a higher need for what? It's right there on the list. Higher need for affection. If your love language is quality time, you have a higher need for attention. If your love language is acts of service, you have a higher need for support. The problem is, there's five additional biological needs that aren't covered. If you think in terms of biology, I don't care whether you're, whether you're African, Slavic, South American, Guatemalan, whatever. All human brains work the same, whether you like it or not. They do. That's why this stuff right here means nothing. All of our brains work the same way. We're all created for healing. We're all, I mean, for, for love. All of us are. We just let surface stuff become the greater value. It isn't. All of our brains work the same. And since all brains work the same, all humans have the same needs, don't they? And God made it so. What if we started to love people at that level and listen for their need rather than for our love language? Make sense? And so real quickly here, let me get an example. Um, all humans have a fallen nature, but also all humans are biologically needy. Got it? So if Luella's nagging, that's a sinful behavior, contentious woman. It's like a slow dripping faucet. So what we do when we see nagging, we complain about nagging. And the Lord looks at me and says, what are you doing? I go, well, I'm sick and tired of those nagging. He says, I get that ass. What are you doing? Well, I'm trying to get her to stop. And he'd say, uh, I thought it was my job to convict her of sin. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you out. I mean, what are you going to tell me at that point, right? 
And he would say, well, I don't need your help, Rick. And in my frustration, well, then what do you want me to do? I'm tired of nagging. He'd say, I'm glad you asked. Here's what you fail to understand, Rick, is this. Underneath Llewellyn's fall me here and nagging is the pain of an unmet need for attention from you. If you spent less time complaining and you spent more time meeting the need for attention, what you don't realize is, Rick, that would go away. That's a symptom of a need. And all I learned was just meet the need. Behavior does not happen in a vacuum. Everything people do, even Rodney, the fact that people do the crazy stuff they do, it's still meeting a need, the cares list, in a rat poison way. You with me? But that's all they know. They get love by giving their body away. It's crazy, yes, because we're looking at it from this worldview, but we don't understand their perspective. Some who were molested decided they're dirty and no good, so they start to give themselves away physically, sexually. Why? Because they believe they have no value or worth anymore because someone raped them or molested them. So now they have a philosophy that I have no value or worth anymore. That's the lie that Satan wants. You are value. You still have worth. But the lie will drive you, which gets to where I want to go now. All right? So then, I believe... Now, let me say this. I'm a minister, I'm a psychologist, so I, I you know, I, it took me a while to change, right? But I also believe we are not slaves to our past. We're not. But modern psychology and counseling tends to make you one. That's why you spend so many years talking about your past and never changing the present. Well, you still live in the present, you better, go, you better do something different. That's why we create Relate Well and all the curriculum I've done prior to that is I teach you what to do in the present to make it different tomorrow. Because if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you got, right? That old insanity thing. So, so if you just follow this conversation with me, and then we'll take some questions and then have lunch. So this is a philosophy question real quick. Here's when you're born. Here's when you die. And people call that life. But I'm going to argue that that's not life. You are alive between birth and death, but that in itself is not life. And I'll prove it by asking a question. Where does life happen? Where does life actually happen? Anybody? Relation. You don't have a relation? There's no life? Where does life happen? Do you mean biologically? Or do you mean in terms of... No, life. Life is a noun. Where does life happen? Yeah, yes, it does. It, it happens everywhere. But where everywhere as it relates to you, as it relates to me, as it relates to you, as it relates to you, as it relates to you, where does it actually happen as it relates to ourselves? That's a time question. That's when it happens. Home. So if you're not home, there's no life? Within us. No, I said where do, life happens everywhere, but everywhere as it relates to yourself. So if you're not somewhere, there's no life? Yeah, but what does that mean? You're already alive. Uh, Adam and Eve didn't die when they sinned. They were still alive. Somebody's supposed to die. They didn't die. They're still alive for a while. Where does life happen? I'll give you the answer. Life happens everywhere outside of you. It's out here. Every living thing exists in life. In other words, on the day that you were conceived, the moment you were conceived, you came into what? Life. Life. And one day, you leave it. And every day, plants, animals, fish, people come into life and they leave life, don't they? And wherever you go, life is. When you travel from your house here, you traveled here in life. When you fly on a mission trip, you travel from here to there in life. Because everywhere you are, life already is. Now, I don't know what's happening in life in all those other places because I'm not there, but life is everywhere. But if I traveled there, I'd be traveling there in life. You with me? So if I ask the question, where does life happen? The answer is outside of me, all around me. And life happens in time. That's the when question. And so when does life happen? 
And it happens moment by moment by moment by moment. It's constantly passing us by in time. And what happened 30 seconds ago in life and time just happened. It'll never happen again. It already happened. In about 30 seconds from right now, life will pass us by. We don't know what it is. For we know in 30 seconds, ISIS shows up and blows us up. We just don't know. Are you with me so far? So life happens outside me, all around me, moment by moment by moment by moment. Now, since life happens outside me, all around me, and it happens in time, way back here in life and time, there are things that happen to us. Right? There are things that happen to us. Then why is it when things happen to us back here in the past, in life and time, people still struggle at age 20, age 30, age 40, age 50, when what happened to you back in life and time haven't happened to you in decades? But you're still struggling. Mm, the, the, the stu- not necessarily. What, we're, what does do it creates the lack of maturity. Memory. So if we just give you a frontal lobotomy, then you'll be healed. I mean, think about it, right? Perspective is just perspective. The perspective of what? You're getting close to it. Huh? What belief? What belief? What's made you, become? Mm, you create the you create you create your becoming. True. Yourself. You, when you talk about core belief, what are you referring to? Belief about what? Stop right there. It's what you believe about yourself. Here's how it works. Way back here. In life and time, there are these things that happen to us. We call those events, right? There's these things that happen. I'm real special. We just call them what happened. All right? Uh, I grew up in Miami. And uh, around eight or nine, my dad decided the boys were going to play baseball. My first year playing baseball, perfect batting record. Never hit the ball. <laughs> what no one ever knew was this. Whenever I get up to bat, I was standing like the, you're supposed to. And I was looking at the pitcher, but I wasn't paying attention to the pitcher. I was paying attention to his voice back behind me. They would say things like, don't you F up. You better be like the other boys. It was my dad. And every time pitchers come by, I strike out. That's just something that happened in life and time. Molested by someone at nine. My father is hypersexual. He, he had a lot of issues. Things happen to us. So this is a circle of what happens to you. There is an event. All right? This is a circle of what happens to us. But what people think is people, don't, people can't change because of what happened. If that's true, if the reason you're dysfunctional is because of what happened, then you must logically admit you can never change. You can never heal. Well, that's not true. Get a flux capacitor, put it on your car, go back in time, undo the event, you can change. But that's not possible. Something else is at play. And here it is. Whenever something takes place in our, in our life, the brain is a meaning-making machine. It attaches meaning to everything. Because the brain has to have context to explain stuff away. That's why you heard the phrase, in the absence of information, the brain will fill in the blanks. It'll just fill it in. Problem is, it fills it in with what it knows, but it's not always accurate. And you tend to be negative, right? So whenever something happens to you, the brain... We call it a story. Creates a story about the event. Now, prior to age 13, when a brain, a child's brain is egocentric, because abstract thinking doesn't kick in until 13 and beyond, so if something happens to a kid way back here, then the child's brain thinks they're the cause of it. Because egocentric thinking is, oh, that happened, what did I do? That's how children's brain think. Abstract thinking kicks in at 13 and goes, oh, they did that because they got the problem. But prior to that, I'm the responsible. What did I do that my, made mom and dad divorce? What did I do that made that person do that to me? So the brain creates a story about the event, and the story is always in the phrase of I or I'm. So if you look on page 16, I identify some stories that people have created for themselves over the years. I'm unlovable. I'm not good enough. I don't matter. I'm bad. I'm unworthy. I'm a failure. I can't do anything right. I'm inadequate. I have no value. I'm not perfect. I'm shameful. I'm ugly. I'm broken. I'm fixable. I'm a loser. I'm stupid or dumb. I'm not smart. I'm unacceptable. All of these are stories. You can circle the ones that you can identify with. My two major stories were I'm not good enough. That came from this one. Way back there, strikes, I strike out. And my brain made a decision. I'm not good enough. Another issue with my stepmother, she didn't take me to the hospital when she should have, 
my brain decided I didn't matter. And what happens is when an event takes place, a child brain makes, has to make sense of the event, and the brain creates a what? A story about the event, but the story's in the phrase of I or I'm. It's like my brain said, makes a decision. I'm not good enough. It just decided that. But then I forgot that I made that decision, but the decision was made. So you start going through life, experiencing more events. So over time, what is your brain doing? It's gathering evidence. What for? To prove that you're right, that you're not good enough. The problem really ultimately is never the event, it's the story. And here's the real problem. Most people live what are called past created futures. You think, what is a past created future? The best way to think about a past created future is think about that painting back there on the wall. Before that painting was, where was it? It was in somebody's mind. Somebody saw that in their head. They could see it in their mind. So for them to take what is possible, because it's not real in life and time because it's not out here. See, it's in life and time right now because you can go touch it. But before it was real out here in life and time, it was just an idea. It was a thought. It was a possibility. So if they wanted to take that and make it possible, they had to have three things for sure. Paint, paintbrushes, and a what? Canvas. What was on the canvas when they started painting? Nothing. The canvas had to be blank, right? Past creative futures. Here's why people don't transform. This is the canvas of your tomorrow. I can ask everybody in here right now, tell me the man of God you want to be. You know exactly what you look like. Tell me the woman of God you want to be. You know exactly what you look like. Tell me the spouse you want to be. You know exactly what you look like. Tell me what you look like 40 years from now. You know exactly what you look like. People know exactly the man of God they want to be, the Christian they want to be. Why is it most people don't achieve it? Past creative futures. Because they look onto the canvas tomorrow. What they don't know they don't know is they take the story, which comes from what? And they write it onto the canvas tomorrow and go, yeah, but I'm not good enough. Yeah, but I don't matter. Yeah, but I'm unlovable. And that's how most people live their lives, past creative futures. They keep writing the story under the canvas of tomorrow. And as long as you live your story on the canvas of tomorrow, you're going to create nothing but more of the story. In other words, when I got my PhD in 1994 and I walked across the stage, my first thought was, I need to get my law degree. Luell told me another wife, another life. Where'd that come from? A story that I'm still not what? And the story drove me to be an overachiever. Where my little brother, it made him quit and just exist. Most people are living out a story from the past that their brain told them when they were a kid because of what happened to them. They just don't know. They keep throwing the story into tomorrow. But nobody wants to sit and listen with them to listen for the story and help them. And sadly, we perpetuate the stories. And, and, and we perpetuate even from the pulpits. When we beat people up, tear them down, you understand? They already know how to do that. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is what? And yet, we'll condemn from the pulpit, but he said there's no condemnation. Why? You don't need to condemn people. They're doing it themselves. They're living out of a story that they created to understand something that happened to them. But nobody cares about what happened. We just want you to stop the effects of this. Because this stuff gets played out in really stupid, crazy ways, doesn't it? I just became an overachiever, so the world goes, oh, he's wonderful. No, I was a wounded kid still living out of a story that I'm not good enough. And so I kept striving and striving and striving <clears throat> until I finally realized that I am good enough. And there's one other thing you're going to have to worry about. And the other thing you're going to have to worry about is called it. Now, um, it is a little voice that sits right back here in the back of your head. Um, I call it it. It is not your friend. It is always listening, and it's already listening. Some of you right now are not listening to me. You're listening to it. It thinks this way. That's not true. That's false. It's like the fans in the stadium. They sit up here, and there's life on the field. The people up here, they think this way. That's a stupid play. What would you make that call for? 
Oh, come on, coach. I want to go, why don't you get out of the stands? Why don't you suit up? Go down there on the field. Tell me if you think the same way. You don't. 300 pounder coming at you. Make a decision. No, I'd rather sit back here and watch life and judge it and criticize it. It thinks this way. You should, you should, you shouldn't. What's in it for me? I, I did that because you did this, or I did that in order to do that. I'm right, you're wrong. That's good, that's bad. All it does is sit, it sits back here, watches life, judges and criticizes it. Criticizes it. But to live life in life is a very different way of living life. If Luella's hurting in front of me, or I got a teammate who's struggling with something, what most people do, they don't come out here in life and deal with them. What they do, they sit in their back and go, oh, there he goes. This guy's incompetent. All that is you and it. But to live life in life is a very different way than living life in your head, watching life. Very different way of living life. And, and so most people live life, they live life not, let me, get, let me get here, let me show you what I'm talking about. I got a graphic for you. You can take a picture of it. So this is my graphic on on, on, on it. <clears throat> That's it. But here's the problem with it. It only cares about two things, and two things only. Looking good and avoiding looking bad. And by the way, since I'm going to look good, I'm going to blame you for what I did, because I ain't looking bad. It is not your friend. And most people live life listening to it. I did. And it will keep you immature, it'll keep you dysfunctional, and it will harm people along the way because it doesn't care about others. And by the way, when it acts like it cares about others, it isn't. Don't trust it. It's still a way to get what it wants. Now, you can deal with your story, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute, but this thing you're going to die with. It's a part of you. You'll have it to the day you die. I like the word it, but the Bible would call this the flesh. I just don't use words because some of the words get so misused by so many different people, I just gave them new meanings, new words. But that's what the Bible called the it. And the story is that the Bible refers to as strongholds. What are strongholds? They're lies. They're lies. Now this rascal, you won't die with it. This is why people become resigned and cynical about life over time. Like a guy not too long ago in my office, he said to me, well, this would be the best my marriage will ever be. Hear the cynicism? And I said to him, you're exactly right. He said, what? I go, you're exactly right. Why would you say that? Well, I'm not. I'm disagreeing with you. Why would you agree with me? I said, well, because it's true. He goes, what are you saying? I said, well, since you have declared this is the best marriage will ever be, it will be. You're speaking it into being every single day because you're speaking your truths into your future, past, period, future. You're exactly right. It will be until you decide it won't be. And when you decide it won't be, then it won't be. Rick, uh, tell me if you would agree or disagree with this or not. When I heard David's question, when I'm thinking about this, I think I'm, I'm trying to think about it from a biblical perspective, but maybe I'm not. It takes an external stimulus, the gospel, the Holy Spirit, a different example, uh, a different, somebody... And rather than me self-introspectively coming up with this truth and determining in myself to make it think, I think as people, we need an external stimuli. Everyone does. Right? So, so the answer is, okay, so Greg has to tell me, somebody has to tell me, you say this, but you do that. Or in a training event, you know, you get this, like, what do they call it, 360 feedback or whatever, and they make you do crazy stuff. And in my case, they filmed it, which was really bad. And then they said, okay, in, in this tension-filled situation, you did this. I'm like, no, I didn't. And they're like, oh, really? Let's watch the film. It was terrible, Daniel. And the guy had it on tape, and he'd go, roll the film. And he'd hit the tape, and then there, there I am dragging this much older gentleman across the field in order to achieve a task that they told me to achieve. And they said, you dragged that guy all the way across the field. I said, no, I didn't, I didn't drag him. I just asked him to come with me. And they're like, oh, really? hit the button, there it was. So there was an external stimuli. There was somebody saying, you didn't communicate what you thought. Or in the case of the Holy Spirit and the gospel, I had to have an external stimuli that I couldn't come up with within myself to see what I really am and therefore what I need to change. 
that yes. Right? Left to your, remember, your brain only knows what it knows. Go back to don't know you don't know. Yeah. Other people see you differently than you see yourself. Right. So if we're going to mature, remember I said uh, maturity requires other people in your life. Yeah. Individualism creates immaturity. Why? I get no feedback. We all need feedback. Who I am. You got to be teachable because other people see me the way that I don't see me. And they see a truth of me that I don't see. And I got to be open to those truths. And then listening to other people's feedback, wisdom on a multitude of counselors, right? Yeah. Then you're able to get feedback. Uh, I don't believe in accountability groups. People lie in them. But anybody heard of a term of a mastermind group? Anybody heard that term? Mastermind groups aren't accountability groups. A mastermind group, Rodney, is when you put three to four people around you that you trust who will never tell you what you want to hear. They own parts of, they own parts of the brain that you don't own. You got it? My brother, my wife, Matthew Meadows, Paul Robertson are my, are my mastermind group. And when I got to make a decision... I ask them. And they're willing to tell me where I'm messing up. But I've made it clear that you own the other parts of my brain that I don't own. I don't have those skills, those skill set. So I will make myself accountable to you, ask questions, and then I'll, I'm going to get feedback. I like that of mastermind groups. They're the people who will tell you what you don't want to hear. They may also tell you, hey, you're right, going, Rick, you made right decision, good job. But they may also go, no, I think you're out of line. My, little, my brother did that to me about three weeks ago. He called me up and goes, um, I'm speaking as your mastermind. All right, let me get myself ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so I said, all right, go for it. And he, go, and he was very gracious, but he pointed out something he thinks I need to work on. And I said, I can do that, Don. And I can do that. All that's external. All that's external. Uh, anything could be external. Yeah, it could be Jesus calling, so devotion. Example, reading something external me that shows me truth. You need input into who you are. Okay. Yes, very much so. Now, real quickly then, the way you deal with this thing is you don't honor it. You got it? Most people listen to it. I, they honor it. So it has power over them. Just when it says, hey, you're not good enough, say, shut up. Here's why. <clears throat> Since the story comes from what we told ourselves back there because of what happened to us, then it begs the question, uh, it begs the question, where did I put that marker? Um, it begs the question then, oh, here it is. Um, we need to deal with the story. So here's the problem right here. This is the actual problem. Because here's why, back there in life and time when those things happen to you, your brain created a story, yes, but your brain made an assumption. And the assumption was this, what happened and the story are in a relationship. That what happened and the story are connected. Rick, why aren't you good enough? I can't hit baseball. Why can't you baseball? Because I'm not good enough. Well, do you matter? Mm -mm, don't matter. Why don't you matter? Well, she didn't take me to the hospital. Why wouldn't she take you to the hospital? Because I don't matter. You hear it? And then God asked me a question. Rick? Have you ever considered that back there in life and time, what happened to you and the story that you told yourself actually in reality back there in life and time had no connection? They're actually distinct. They're two separate events that took place side by side. I mean, you think about right here, right now, in this moment, since life happens moment by moment by moment, there's a lot of things taking place around us, right? But we're not connecting any of them, are we? Right? He's sitting there, oh, they're grinning, but I'm not connecting that to what I'm doing. All right? For all I know is he's got gas, he's just trying to hold it in. I don't know, right? <laughs> right? But we connect those two things together and we push it into our future. And then the Lord said, have you ever considered that back there in life and time, those two things were distinct? They had no connection. And then I had to ask a question. The brain's a meaning-making machine. This is why I believe you can transform your life in the present, in the moment, right here, right now. Because then I said, the brain, meaning makes sense. So I said, Lord, how do you explain what my dad did? And he said to me, well, you feel to understand, Rick. Your dad did what he did because your dad was trapped in a story from his father. And your father's story damaged you kids. And for the first time, I no longer saw my father as an offender. 
also some of the what? He was a victim too. Problem, my dad died at age 47, still in his story. Never healed from it. And then I went, huh. I forgave my dad, and then I remember it as I'm standing here. I felt it in my body. I went, wait a minute. You're suggesting I'm good enough. You're suggesting that I matter. You're suggesting I have value. You're suggesting that I'm lovable. He said, yes. Well, Lord, I need something out here in life and time that doesn't matter what I tell myself in my head. I can hang my hat on it. And just like Jesus does in the old ways, he asks questions. He asked me some questions. Rick, would I die for something that didn't matter to me? No, sir. Would I die for something that didn't have value? No, sir. Would I die for something that I didn't think was lovable? No, sir. And then I realized something. I've always been lovable. I do matter. I am good enough. And no one can ever take that away from me because the cross proves that I am. And I put my story there. Did I ha still have to deal with some things? Yes. I had to deal with residue. But I began to trust the story that he declared over me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And when we tell people from the pulpits, you're a filthy, rotten, no good sinner, that is against the scripture. You don't die for things that are filthy, rotten. You die for things that you value. Not that you hate. We die for things we value. Most people do not know they have value because the parents were so broken themselves they couldn't teach their own kids they have value. And they go into their adult world. There's four questions everybody has to have answered in life. Am I lovable? Do I matter? Do I have value? And do I have a purpose? And if those four are not answered, you are going to try and figure them out in unhealthy ways, rat poison ways. But when those four questions are settled in a person's heart, their heart moves to peace. Where's the best place to get those four things answered? The cross. It's the cross. Not the gay initiative. Not here. Not drinking. Not with your crazy buddies that do all kinds of crazy stuff. They're trying to get those answered in rat poison ways. When the cross already declares that you are. And no one can ever take that away from you. Ever. Link your story to that. And you'll start to live a very different life in the moment.